Fun fact, in Norwegian, model land means model duck. Model land is quite possibly the most insane book I've ever read. It is at times completely unhinged while at the same time manages to maintain some degree of cohesive narrative. Kind of an odd accomplishment, frankly, but I was entertained. Didn't always make sense and there were problems with the plot, but I did have fun. Monoland is the first in a series written by super celebrity Tyra Banks. If you're not familiar with her, Tyra Banks is a supermodel who also hosted America's Next Top Model. The Tyra Banks Show has written other books, mostly on fashion and uh, autobiographies. Tyra Banks is well known for being very level-headed. <laughs> She's often very calm and rational. Oh, you changed? Yeah, you changed because you had to. Because if you didn't, no one would want your ass. Oh, but it's, oh, no, 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 it's too late. And she does her utmost to maintain herself as a good role model for others. I have never in my life yelled at a girl like this. When my mother yells at this, it's because she loves me. I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. How dare you learn something from this? Now, this was a bit unusual for me to really get into because I know next to nothing of makeup or fashion or modeling. A cursory glance at my wardrobe will demonstrate this. I don't really care about fashion. As far as I see it, the modeling industry is kind of a joke that it doesn't understand its making. Why is runway fashion so weird? Now, that being said, I did try to go into this book with a little open-minded and try to accept things because I didn't really know that much about Tyra Banks when I started, but decided to try to steel man the situation and give her the benefit of the doubt and look at the book in the best light possible. After all, Tyra Banks was not the scum of the earth. She was not an old man with a waifu complex, and she wasn't dead. I really didn't do any research on Tyra Banks herself. I wanted the book to speak for itself without me having to do too much research to understand modeling or makeup or anything like that. Give the book a chance to explain all these different points without me having to engross myself in a subject I'm not passionate about. And for the most part, the book succeeds in that. The things that it sets up, it explains well enough, or doesn't really utilize them too heavily. There are some terms that I'm not familiar with that I'm sure would be uh, benefited from me having been familiar with French, but you can get through this book without knowing anything about fashion, modeling, makeup, whatever, and it will still make sense. But even though I tried to separate the art from the artist, I did eventually have to do some research into Tyra Banks and try to better understand who she was so that I could possibly get an answer to some of the questions that I still had. I attempted to watch America's Next Top Model, and I got about two episodes in when I decided, no, I'm not going to do this, and so instead I just watched the Edna and Jack-Jack special from The Incredibles. I mean, it's basically the same thing, right? I suggest you extinguish the baby's flames before he trips the sprinkler system. <laughs> the flame retardant is blackberry lavender, uh -huh. Effective, edible, and delicious. No, most of the research I did came down to watching videos on the channel Cruel World Happy Mind, so a special thank you shout out to her. She has some videos on uh, Tyra, the MLM she apparently tried to run, as well as an exposed video on how bad America's Next Top Model apparently is, as well as a video on the secrets of the modeling industry itself. All three videos will be linked in the description. But what is Model Land? Well, it's not just a book, it's also a theme park. Or at least it was supposed to be one. Much in line with the themes of Model Land itself, Tyra has attempted to open up a theme park of her own called Model Land. Imagine a place that's full of fierce and fantasy, photo shoots and runways, storytelling, and theater. The idea is you'd go in there role-playing as your ideal self, and you get awesome fashion tips, awesome makeup tips, you've got uh, industry experts around to 
give advice and to judge you. The idea was that you're supposed to be living a day in the life of someone in Model Land, as wildly creative as that sounds. I don't think it has a lot of potential myself, and it's it sounds like one of those niche ideas that would run out of business in like two or three years, but I don't know. Maybe there actually is something that's really to it, and fans will really enjoy it. I can't really judge on that front. But we won't really know how successful it'll be because it was supposed to open in late 2019, early 2020, and you know, things didn't work out for that. Tara even went to Harvard Business School in order to get a degree in business management to make sure that she could properly run modeling, which I think is actually really admirable. That is going fully into a passion project in order to make sure you properly understand it instead of just jumping in assuming you knew what you were doing, which is probably why the ticket prices ranged from, let me make sure I got this right, uh, $56 to about $1,500. This park was not built to cater only for the super rich. Everyone in the world has the right to enjoy these animals. Sure, they will. It, what, we'll have a, a coupon day or something. <laughs> now, maybe it'll be a tremendous success when it eventually opens. I don't know, we'll just have to wait and see. But we're not talking about a theme park, we're talking about a book today. Now, what is this book about? The protagonist is a down under luck girl named Tuki de la Creme. Tuki lives in a country called Metopia. Uh, fashion is the utmost importance to everybody. Modeling, fashion industries, ways to make yourself look younger, all of it, it is central to, I guess, their culture. And part of that is because in the middle of the country is this massive mountain, at the very top of which you have Model Land, which is where this, this magical kingdom, where the models are raised, trained, go to school, uh, get the, the best fashion tips. And when time comes, the best of the models will descend upon the lower masses and, you know, be really pretty and help sell stuff. It, it's not exactly clear how this works. It's just, models are super cool. Don't you want to be one? All right. A lot of this requires you to turn your brain off. Like, this is clearly a young adult book, despite the width of the book. This is a little over 500 pages, so a bit heavy for most young adult novels. Most of Rick Reardon's books are pushing around 200-ish pages. That's normally what you'd want to aim for. This can work. I mean, what, the last Harry Potter book was like 700 pages, I think? So it can be done, but for a first novel, this is a little much. That being said, the word choice, the pacing, definitely works for a younger audience. Almost a little too well. There are a number of moments where you kind of have to just shut up and accept that that's how things go. It doesn't make a lot of sense in context. You can't really think about the biology of some of the creatures in the story. Like, their nurses are called purses, and somehow they have evolved to have roller skates on, like, instead of feet. That is not even close to the weirdest in this book. No, this book is the plot of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, set at Hogwarts, which is run by the guys who ran the Hunger Games, and was written while Tyra was snorting 10 pounds of cocaine a day. The book's pacing runs at breakneck speed, and we'll get to that in a little bit. It jumps from topic to topic to topic very, very quickly, oftentimes, sometimes without any real logical consistency for it. The flow is very choppy at moments, and it like as you're processing one plot point, the characters have already moved on to another plot point. The logic of the book is kind of a, I guess that works, sort of. Really, Banks is going for weird for the sake of weird, so she's clearly trying to have fun. And I can, I can respect that. I can let the book try to be fun, and I can try not to question too much of it, but taken out of context, so many of these moments make no bloody sense. To give you an idea of what is in this book, it contains nightmare mirrors that make your skin melt, belts that grant superpowers, clocks that use color instead of numbers, period erasing technology, 
and a monster made up of legs and feet that grows by ripping off other people's legs and feet and adding them to its collective mass. That last one is a footnote of a scene, if anything. Also, when I found this book originally, it was going for $45 on Amazon. Needless to say, this is a used copy. Thank you, Thriftbooks. Not sponsored, I just want you guys to get a good deal. Part of the publicity she attempted to do was by releasing a theme song for Model Land. Now, I can't play it here, obvious copyright problems, but I do think that one particular commenter uh, on the video got it exactly right when he said, it sounds like she used Microsoft Paint to record this. Allegedly it was linked on her Twitter profile at one point. And last note before we actually get into this, quick apology on the editing of this video. Normally what I'll do is I'll try to find a PDF of whatever I'm reviewing or an ebook if failing that. And I couldn't actually find anything for some reason there doesn't seem to be a Kindle version of modeling, at least not as far as I can see, or am willing to download onto my computer. So normally what I like to do is have the text up on screen, you know, good and easy for all of you to read along with, and that I can highlight, but I had to go with scans of the book. That was really the best I could find. Sorry in advance for the quality of some of the images that I'm gonna have to use. But that's enough background stuff for now. It is time to gaze into the abyss of Model Land. Now, a common complaint that a lot of YouTube critics will have is the use of exposition dumps in order to get a lot of info across very quickly. Unfortunately, the first three pages of this book exemplify this tremendously. Hey, that's me, but you already know I'm gonna tell you things I could probably show. Hey, welcome to the world I live in. What? It's the exposition. The first three pages go over such ideas as what Model Land is, uh, who the 7-7 seven seven are, the day of discovery, the land, which is a phrase that gets dropped pretty early, actually, what a smize is in the context of this story, and the Pilgrim Plague. All of that laid out in three pages and told by a narrator who never actually shows up in the text and stops narrating the stories. Like, some of the chapters open with this narrator speaking, kind of this Edna Mode accent that I can't possibly replicate. You want to be there. You know you do. Don't lie, darling. It's okay. I know what you're thinking when you look up at that splendorous place atop the mountain. I know it fills you, spurs you on, fuels your dreams. You're obsessed with being chosen. Everyone is. Now, unfortunately, everything that is in these three pages are going to be repeated for us and explained in greater detail later on. The first three pages are completely useless. They do give you an idea of what to expect, but they're not brought in naturally. This is the studying you do before the test. Like this, these three pages are a cram session. That's not to say that we're done with exposition because the first several chapters can all be broken down into a few scant details exploring niche topics. Chapter one, Tookie's school life. Chapter two, Tookie's social standing and her only friend. Chapter three, Tookie and her family. It goes on like that. And that's not awful. You can make that work. The problem is a lot of the prose is very clumsy. So you're going to get reminders of certain things over and over and not in a way that really fits the characters. It's more like she wants to make sure that you're still following along. It's been like 10 minutes since we talked about how great models are, but at least Banks was generous enough to give us a foreboding warning about how we were gonna get sledgehammered with some of the repetitive garbage in this book. Tookie de la Creme has one of the most descriptive and cruelest introductions I can think of for any character ever. Have you seen her? The girl whose face not even the meanest person you know would describe as yuck, but who you'd never in a million, no, a trillion years, describe as alluring either. The girl whose eyes are three centimeters too far apart and whose mouth is four centimeters too wide. Not that you'd break out a ruler, but when you look at her, it's enough to make you say that something is definitely off. Oh, and we're not done. This goes on for a full page. One of the phrases in particular is that 
She is the girl whose hair has multiple personality disorder, which is a phrase that I kept coming across in some of the interviews she did for this book. She has what she calls multiple personality disorder hair. Even when the italicized narrator's uh, section is done with, it just keeps going on because after that, her large mismatched eyes didn't blink as she stared at the stained ceiling. Her gangly legs shot out at odd angles, as though she'd fallen from a six-story building. Her enormous feet pointed straight up. Like, I can't call Banks' descriptions here bad because they are very visual. You can definitely see what she's trying to paint. But it's so cartoony that I can't take this book seriously. Now, Tookie's description oftentimes come down as something of a joke because Banks often described herself as a little funny looking as a kid. When I was 11 years old, I grew three inches and lost 30 pounds. And I became the freak, the weirdo. And on top of that, for some reason, my forehead kept growing faster than the rest of my body. So, of all of you wondering if this is actually a self-insert, yeah, the author pretty much confirmed it. And she has one green eye and one brown eye. So she's based off of me. Of course, I don't have one green <laughs> eye and one brown eye. I got two green eyes, but I got a big ass forehead. But we do eventually get some description of who Tuki is as a person instead of just funny looking. For example, she loves whipped cream. And this is one of the things that I think that Banks actually did right because you get references to her love of whipped cream uh, kind of sporadically throughout the rest of the book. It's a small touch, but eh, one that kind of brings back to a central idea, which I appreciate it at least. Tookie calls herself a forgetter girl because she doesn't meet the usual beauty standards that are demanded of kids at her country, kingdom, continent, whatever, it's not really clear. So she is very frequently overlooked. Uh, almost nobody at school actually talks to her. Her only real conversations come down to her family or her one friend, Lizzie. In fact, in order to test this, she has what she calls the SPLD, the silent protest by laying down. But even though she doesn't have anyone to actually talk to and thus exchange dialogue that we can use to get deeper character moments, she does have a diary. So there's kind of a workaround and the diary is utilized pretty effectively because we, every couple of chapters, get her perspective and see how she's doing as the plot progresses. But there are plenty of bad moments because in this example, we are told, not shown, that Tuki is a master linguist and at the age of 15 has mastered almost every world tongue. Over the I in her name, Tuki added a tiny FG for forget a girl. But before closing T Mail Jail, her diary, she thumbed through its previous entries, admiring the rainbow of colors. Every color represented a different language. Flamingo pink for Gaudine Anne, Cabernet grape for Tres Jolie, Mandarin orange for Bay Jingle, and Skyscraper gray for Colorian, the language spoken in the distant lands of Sans Color. Tookie had a knack for quickly picking up foreign languages and wrote whole letter entries in them. By the age of 11, Tookie knew 28 languages. Now at 15, she spoke nearly every world tongue. And this is kind of a good bad moment. Good because it toys around with the idea that no one ever pays attention to her. She has mastered almost every language on the planet and no one will talk to her. I don't even mind that she's mastered all these languages. Again, this is meant for a younger audience so you can suspend a little bit more belief than normal. So the idea of a 15 year old being a master linguist, like to the point where I don't think she has an equal on Earth. Fine, I'll take it, I don't care. The problem is we don't have that really laid out in a, in a good imaginative way. Uh, there could have been like a foreign exchange group coming by, uh, wandering through the hallways, speaking you know between themselves in various languages and she could have overheard everything while they're describing various aspects of the school and how it compares to their worlds or their countries and cultures see that way you get a twofer you get a little more detail on the universe and you get a more colorful way of describing that she knows all these languages 
But even when Banks does try to show instead of tell things, oftentimes it's very clunky and overly wordy. In a later scene in the cafeteria, she runs into Theophilus Lovelaces. He's the class president, he's very smart, he's very generous, and he's one of the only people at the entire school who even acknowledges that Tookie is there. Like, He'll speak to her occasionally, and then she'll lock up and forget to say anything. In this one moment, though, uh, he trips over somebody else, and he's got a, an election pin that says, Vote for love. You know, love laces, hey, get it? Well, his election pin goes flying across the floor and gets a little scuffed up. Eventually lands in a trash can where Tookie, like a crazed stalker, uh, goes running for it and digs it out of the trash. She reached to the trash can, took a deep breath, and plunged her hands into it. She felt slimy banana peels, congealed macaroni and cheese, crusty heels of bread, and sticky soda cans. Finally, her fingers curled around the button, and she pulled it out with glee. The poor thing was badly damaged, dented, and slimy from its voyage. In fact, it no longer said, vote for love. Instead, the V and O and E of the first word were gone. The F and R of the second were totally erased. And of the last word, the L was knocked into non-existence, and the V was scratched so badly it resembled a K, but the E remained intact. And that clunky assemblage of words was there to tell you that the vote for love now said Tookie. Now I have no idea if I'll be able to do this. There's, on the inside cover, you've got a bunch of random art featuring all sorts of different things from the book. One of them is actually the button itself. I'm, I'll see if I can get a better picture uh, up on screen, but it says Tookie, and, and I was really confused how a V could be scratched in such a way that it looked like a K. Like, it doesn't work, really, especially because the words aren't spaced right for that to have spelled anything out. Like, you don't have enough space for the word vote to even be there. But even though... Tookie does have a crush on the uh, the class president. He is unfortunately spoken for, and he is dating Zarpesa Zarinu. About half the letters in her surname are not actually pronounced. She is very French. Well, we're not French. Well, why do you talk? Because we're rude. It just sounds better with a French accent. As the school day nears its end, uh, Tookie goes to her last class. Autology, which stressed that students must look inside themselves to determine what sort of factory work would best suit them. Yeah, in this universe, if you're not a model, you're probably working retail or in a factory somewhere, which again gives us a very limited view as to what the whole world is supposed to look like, but I'm probably being unfair. Tookie's school, for example, is called B3 because it used to be a factory that churned out baubles, bangles, and beads. As Tookie goes about her day, we get exposition for all sorts of other things, like how Metopia is uh, split into four quadrants. There's also uh, CL, who is a rare triple seven seven. She's basically, I'll explain more of this later on when it becomes more relevant. CL is something of a super celebrity uh, within Model Land. She has abilities and beauty and grace that other models cannot compete with, and she is pretty much the top of the top of perfection. But for some reason, she's been missing for several months. And so you've got plenty of graffiti and chalk art and signs you know, demanding where the hell is CL. Now, after class, Tookie, instead of going home, goes to visit her friend Lizzie, who is homeless and lives in a tree. After Tookie complains a little bit because she's jealous that that rich bitch Zarpesa gets Theophilus all to herself. Well, Lizzie has a secret. A group of shabby people stood around the dumpster. Some of them wore masks. The tallest man wore a gas mask. A shorter woman wore a tribal mask. And what looked like a girl Tookie's age had on a tattered comedy tragedy mask. The girl carried a familiar yellow dream bag in the crook of her elbow. Tookie frowned. The woman in the tribal mask pushed in front of the rest and grabbed handfuls of untouched fish fillets half-drained bottles of wine, and loaves of day-old Shrejoli bread. Zar, baby, I am so sorry. You don't deserve this. Take the sea bass. It's still warm. And even though we don't see her face, we get enough description to know that, yes, that is, in fact, Zarpesa there digging for food through a trash can. Dumpster, rather. And this moment, although seemingly random, will actually be central to both of their 
characters throughout the rest of the book. But like I said, this book likes to jump from plot point to plot point at breakneck speed. And just as you're wrapping up thinking about this whole dumpster incident, Lizzie has kind of a meltdown moment. Suddenly, mid-sentence, Lizzie's expression changed, clouding and contorting into a look Tookie knew all too well. Something else had overtaken Lizzie's mind. Her body twitched. The muscles in her face stretched and contracted. She glared blankly into Tookie's eyes. Tell them to stop, Tookie pleaded in a strange, garbled voice. They always say it won't hurt, but it does. Lizzie, come back, Tookie urged, grabbing Lizzie by her shoulders and shaking her. I can take it when they hurt me, but when they hurt Robin, I feel it more. Robin again? Lizzie, who is Robin? And that leads to an uncomfortable moment as Lizzie grabs a sharp rock and stabs herself in the inner arm. Now, take this scene and throw it away. We're never really going to bring it back ever again. Part of the problem of this book, part of what makes discussing it so difficult, is there are all sorts of things that get established in like chapter 3 that aren't utilized until chapter 40. It, it doesn't feel like Chekhov's gun, where you establish one central idea and it has a payoff later on in the third act. It feels more like just an extremely delayed setup and payoff. And unfortunately, th this happens for like 10 different things that I could list. Which is part of what makes reading this such a challenge because even though it is a simple book with simple concepts to play around with, there's so much you have to keep track of or that you're expected to keep track of that a lot of the reason why I actually succeeded is because I took a crap ton of notes. I've got 33 pages of notes here. On top of that, you've got other things that are brought up like this scene with Lizzie just now that aren't utilized for the rest of the book, but are probably meant to be uh, included in a sequel, which by the way, this was published in 2011, and if, as of 2021, we still don't have a second book in the series. Maybe Banks is really busy and can't actually sit down to write. It's, she, she said it took her five years to write this book. Honestly, I believe that, but we still got nothing. Eventually, Tookie does make her way home, and her home life isn't much better than her school life. In fact, it might actually be worse. Now, the narrator sets up the house that it sounds fantastic a splendiferous luxurious palazzo of a dwelling with a marble facade grand archways and columns wrought iron balconies and its second floor bedrooms and a fountain in the center of the yard complete with a nude male statue with rippling musculature despite that Tookie's description on the next page is Tookie walked up the seven stairs that led to the front door tripping on the crooked third step Another piece of slate broke off from the roof and fell to the ground, nearly slicing her skull in two. I think what Banks is going for is kind of a beauty is only skin deep sort of a thing. Like we've got uh, what at first glance might seem splendiferous is actually rotting and falling apart. And if that's what she's going for, hey, bravo, that's good imagery. But because one section is described by a narrator and the other is described from the, pers the perspective of the protagonist, it kind of sends a conflicting image. Like, is one seeing something that the other isn't? It feels like there's room for extra information that we never really get. Although part of that could just be room for debate among readers. Sometimes that's the best part of a book, like actually describing what certain things mean or what certain images actually include. Go to a Lord of the Rings uh, forum and ask if a Balrog actually has wings. Although I'm not sure about this line. The narrator describes the house and says it's the cream of the de la creams. I can't decide if that line is clever or stupid. Tookie's mother, Mrs. de la creme, or creamy as she insisted everyone call her, including her children. There's no way that's gonna... <gasps> and you'll see you get lots of yummy, creamy, delicious filling. Is kind of neurotic. She has this exaggerated form of OCD, which actually never really comes up later in the book. Like this is a character trait that gets introduced and after like chapter eight, you never see it again. I'm kind of confused because it actually conflicts with who she is later in the book, but I'm jumping ahead of things. I'm having a panic attack right now, Mrs. De La Creme exclaimed. Tookie's mother loomed over the kitchen counter, holding a bunch of bananas by the fingertips of one hand, examining their skins with a photographer's loop. Her other arm held Bellissima, 
A lifelike baby doll dressed in a multi-layered butter yellow dress with lace trim, com uh, complete with a pacifier in her mouth. Bellissimo was Mrs. De La Creme's favorite doll from her extensive collection. I thought this banana was spotless, but it has one tiny brown speck! Yuck! She tossed the banana into the trash. Yeah, she likes her bananas really green for some reason. Toki also has a younger sister named Miracle, who at one point is described as being as dumb as a lobotomized turkey. Because Miracle is talented at dancing and is uh, supposed to be really beautiful, the family is going to do their utmost to make her stand out during the Day of Discovery, where Model Ann sends scouts out to try to find new models to bring into their school. I think dance will help Miracle on the Day of Discovery, Ryan wrapped his arm around Miracle's shoulder. His voice was both feathery and sharp. Right, doofus? It's true, Creamy, Miracle whined, not noticing Brian's insult. She usually didn't. What I have to do first to prepare is to get my dancing to perfectness -ness. That way, I can pose the best of the zest in a vest and pass the test and be the guest and walk with zest unless they want me to walk from the east to the west and she launched into a tap number. Like, I don't even know what the hell was supposed to mean. And then there's the tragic case of Tookie's father, Chris Krem Crobat. Formerly a talented acrobat, uh, Mr. Chris Krem Crobat had an unfortunate accident that cost him his eye. And because of that, he hasn't really been able to work. Her father, the mighty Chris Krem Crobat, was going to execute a new move that evening. Circo de Sol had billed it as the first time any human had ever attempted such a feat. Mrs. De La Creme was full of pride in that evening, too. However, right as Tookie's father had reached the seventh story landing on the stage, Mrs. De La Creme pulled out her mirror to add a bit of wrinkle redux to her tanned and hideously lined face. I want to look my best when the, when the cameras all turn to me after this feat is done, she murmured. But the mirror caught a beam of light that shone right into Chris Krem Crobat's eyes, momentarily blinding him. In a panic, he lost his footing and fell seven stories. Most acrobats would have just uh, would have had extensive injuries or even died, but not Tookie's nibble father. He tucked his body and landed smoothly on his upper back, propelling himself forward into a smooth tumble. The audience erupted into cheers. Chris Krem Crobat then arched upwards to stand from his backband and faced his adoring, applauding, whistling, screaming fans. Ever the devoted showman, he thrust himself forward into a deep bow, impaling his eye on one of the five-foot swords at the perimeter of the stage. One thing I forgot to mention, because this book has a lot of stuff going on, is that uh, Creamy has some untimely uh, wrinkles on her face. She seems way too young to have as many wrinkles as she does, and Tookie wonders if it's some sort of a genetic thing that she's going to inherit someday. What could this mean? Yeah, it's another one of those things that gets mentioned here in chapter three and answered in chapter, like the second to last one. So it's not just that the parents uh, kind of ignore Tookie and dote on Miracle. The, they kind of treat Tookie as a servant in a quasi-abusive way, not like hitting her or anything, but definitely emotionally neglectful. Think Harry Potter to the Dursleys. Woman? Mr. De La Creme said through clenched teeth. You still have a brand new unused kettle on the stove. And you don't even drink tea because you say the leaves are dried up and stale. Mrs. De La Creme stared at him. Tookie, make me some tea. Tookie flinched. But Creamy, you d -d don't like. Duh, duh, duh. Mrs. De La Creme imitated nasally. Spit it out. So Tookie goes to make some tea, pour some water from the faucet, but because the house is as old and unkempt as it is, a lot of the pipes need uh, work, so the water comes out kind of brownish yellow. Tookie turned back to the tap. The small yellow bubble began to expand, filling half of the kitchen sink. Then it changed color from spicy red to soothing blue to emerald green, and finally to a plethora of yellows. It was strangely beautiful. Tookie carefully picked up the bubble with her hands, and then before her eyes, the bubble flattened itself and transformed into cellophane-thin, golden cat's eyes sunglasses without the frames. Yes, Tookie has discovered a special talisman called a smize. Now, I haven't gone over this because, frankly, if I was going to imitate the book, I would have to lay out a bunch of exposition at the beginning of the review and it'd be way too much 
overloading you guys. So now Smize is something that's somewhat associated with Tyra Banks's uh, brand. It's when you smile with your eyes, which as any photographer can tell you is a real phenomenon. You can actually tell when someone is smiling genuinely if their eyes kind of reflect some degree of happiness or joy. Smiles in this universe, however, is more akin to a golden ticket from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Every year, a few days leading up to the Day of Discovery, when the scouts go out to try to find new models, um, Smizes are released through the waterways of Metopia and, and the world in general. And if you get one, you have a 91% increased chance of getting selected by a scout. And yet for some reason you can't get them wet even though they travel through water. It's one of those things that demands questions because like, okay, how does it work? What's the material comprised of? What sort of weird magic allows it to travel through the waterways in the first place? And of course there's the immediate consequence of this because the Day of Discovery is so widely popular. It's a, a day that is more popular than every other uh, national holiday combined, water usage goes up exponentially during this two-week period, I'd say. People take more showers, they go to the pool more often, they do more dishes, water the gardens more often. It actually causes droughts. And weirdly enough, just after they're introduced, they are largely useless. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's this happens a lot in this book. But of course, Smize being a very significant discovery and the family putting all of their hopes and dreams on Miracle getting selected for uh, the Day of Discovery, Tookie loses the Smize, the, like, her parents actually take it from her, and the plan is to give it to Miracle so she can get selected. Mr. De La Creme petted his wife's arm. Calm down, Creamy. Everything is going to be okay. Excuse me, Mrs. De La Creme shot him a look. I cannot believe your flabby couch potato ass has the audacity to tell my hardworking firm one that everything will be okay. Some of the lines in this book, I swear to God. Come on, dude, let's go. Hey, let's go. Hold on a second. Come on, we're gonna be late. Let me finish this. <laughs> but it's not enough to just have a smize. You also got to make sure that you look good. So. Tookie is dragged along to the mall by her mother and Miracle so they can go get Miracle some more clothes and better makeup. And that's when Tookie runs into a kindly looking homeless guy named Wingtip. Oh, I'm sorry, were you expecting me to actually give you any kind of an explanation to who Wingtip is? I, he's described as some homeless looking guy that Tookie nicknamed Wingtip, and then we move on. He does become relevant later on, but again? It's introduced to chapter five, and doesn't become relevant until like the second to last chapter. Okay, drinking game, take a shot every time that happens, or every time something's introduced that isn't utilized, but could be utilized for a sequel. You'd be surprised how quick you'd get drunk. But while they're at the mall, an announcement comes from Model Land. The, the clouds part, and a voice booms from the mountaintops. Clouds swirled in the sky, lightning bolts danced and snapped. In a moment, you will lay your eyes upon this year's graduating class of Model Land, the grand voice explained. As you all know, only seven girls graduate from Model Land each year, and those talented seven join the ranks of the only famous people known throughout the world, the Intoxabellas. Okay, so the hierarchy of Model Land makes no sense. To properly explain it, I would need a flow chart. And there are multiple sections here that are actually kind of contradictory. Now we're told that those seven girls who graduate Model Land become known as Intoxabellas. But in order to compete for the 7-7 seven -seven tournament that they just finished up here in this scene, they have to be Intoxabellas already. All right, so this is just gonna be a quick rundown of how Model Land society works. And this is just the stuff I remember off the top of my head, so it's not going to be complete. So, at the very top you have the Belladonna. She's effectively the queen of Model Land. Below that you have something of a legislative branch known as, uh, made up of a council known as the Board. They're comprised of the top members of gurus who work as teachers in Model Land. And also kind of subservient to the Belladonna and also as advisors. Now. Next to them in rank, you have the Seven Sevens, which are the top 
intoxibellas. The intoxibellas are a broader class of models that make up effectively upperclassmen. Below them you have the bellas, and below them you have the noces, which are the first years. Uh, somewhere in between them you have the manicants, and those are effectively just the servants. If you flunked out of model land, but you really didn't want to leave, you have the option of becoming a servant and just kind of staying in the background there. It's a play on words. Get it? Instead of manicant, it's manicant, because they couldn't cut it. I get it! And that is a brief rundown. That is That doesn't include some of the other groups or the male model school up there, Bestosterone. The original Greek word model means misshapen ball of clay, and I try to think about that every time I get in front of the camera. It's a confusing mess, and on top of that, you have the special standout powers that you gain when you get a belt from it. Look, okay, it's, it's really not clear. On one hand, it, like this scene, it carries on and it there's so much setup I've got to explain in order for make, to make this make sense. The only way I can really explain this is after having read the book and just trying to consider everything and make it make sense after the fact. Going through this, you're told one thing, but that's not quite right, so you got to correct that a little bit. But that's not quite right, because you got to correct that a little bit. The, the model land is called the land at the start of the book, and several chapters in, Banks stops using that, so uh, was did was there a name change? Did something going on? Is the land some broader thing that I just missed context for? This is part of the reason why this book is frustrating, because it starts kind of contradicting itself, but not exactly. It's not a full-on you said A when you meant B thing. It's kind of like an ugly mesh of the two. All right, ranch over. So... This actually harkens back to the reason why Tyra Banks wanted to write this book in the first place. I get asked, supermodel, what does that mean? You guys have superpowers? And I said, you know what, yeah. So I jot it down. Modeling boarding school. Maybe supermodels do have superpowers. So maybe I should do this book in fantasy land, in adventure, and have magic like these journalists used to joke about. And then that's how Model Land came to be. Yes, the impetus for this book was a stupid joke. And I'd be fine with that. I would be fine with a stupid joke spawning the entirety of the city. That's, that's kind of why we got World, like, uh, what was it, Team America World Police. A lot of us, being Americans, have, have heard the phrase, you know, stop policing the world and you think you're the world's police. And so we're like, well, let's just make that a totally real thing. Let's go police the world! Yeah! Okay. Nice world. Now, what's really disappointing, and I'll just get this out of the way because I'm going to lose track of it later on. Tyra Banks created a magic system, exclusively utilized by supermodels. And she almost never uses it. What? What? We've got an entirely superfluous magic system. Like, short of flying and teleporting, none of the powers they come up with ever really get used. I mean, like, in a way that means anything. So we get this announcement from Model Land while Tookie and her family are in the mall. And the voice announces this year's 7-7. And that stands for the stunning, statuesque, strobotronic stars with stupefying stratospheric struts. We're led to believe that the 7-7 seven seven here are given belts called centuras, which allow them to access or activate their inherent power. Except those same belts are also given to the first years. So Toki's eventually gonna get a belt and Toki's never really gonna rely on the magic power. Like it's got, there's so much wrong with this. So the models are all introduced and they all have one of seven different types of magic abilities. So you've got powers like uh, Chameleon, which is the ability to change your appearance. Multiplicity, which is the ability to duplicate yourself to what limit we don't really get an answer. Teleportaling, which is the ability to teleport, and those are the useful powers. It sounds like Banks was just screwing around because she had to arbitrarily come up with seven different powers and ran out after three ideas. 
The other powers are 30 never, which is where you stop aging at 30 and then you revert back to 17 and then you start aging like normal until you reach 30 and then it goes back again. Excite to buy, which is where you make people want to buy things. Six Sensa, which is the ability to predict next year's fashion trends, which sounds impressively useless. And then arguably the worst one, the one that's like not even a real power, Seduction, the ability to easily seduce men. That's not a superpower, guys are easy. After they get back from the mall, Tokyo overhears her parents arguing later that night and it's rather unsettling. I do know what I'm talking about, Mr. De La Creme said calmly. She's not mine, Creamy. I haven't felt like she was mine from the second she hit puberty. She went from adorable to atrocious almost overnight. Both parents argue a lot, but it ultimately comes down to Mr. De La Creme does not think that Tuki is his daughter. And this is something that haunts Tuki for the rest of the book, and appropriately so. This does make for really good character motivation, and whether or not this is actually true is something that could be saved for much later in the series. It's one of the plot points that I think Banks actually handled pretty well. The wording leading up to it's uh, maybe a little bumpy, but the core concept is pretty good, which was part of why I said I actually enjoyed sections of this book. There is some polish to be found in here. The problem is you've got to get through a lot of weird stuff first. We haven't gotten to the weird yet. So because of this sudden confession from her father, as well as him declaring that he doesn't want her in this house anymore and he's sending her to work in the factories, Tookie decides to undergo Plan Exodus, which is where she and uh, Lizzie will leave home together and just travel the world side by side, nobody else holding them back. But as Tookie is getting everything ready and getting ready to leave that morning, uh, the parents actually got up early. They wanted to get to the day of discovery with plenty of time to spare. They actually intercept her, throw Tookie in the car along with Miracle, and they all drive to the plaza where the day of discovery is being held. And that would be Ladorno, which is the luxury section of the country. You've got people still asking where the hell is CL, as well as protesters lining the sidewalks holding up signs that said, Women don't walk, it's all a sham, t dots a crock, a phony exam. Oh, also there are these three obelisks that appeared overnight six months ago that are called the Obscure Obelisks. People of the land thought that, or of, the, of Metopia, thought that it was some sort of a sign blessing the Day of Discovery, even though it was half a calendar away. Take a shot, you can find out what it is much later in the book. So the ceremony begins, uh, you get everyone meeting in this large plaza, and the mayor comes out and gives a speech. It's a lot of the usual, uh, oh my god, who are they gonna pick this year, kind of stuff. He does have one line that I rather enjoy though. More cheers. And if you are not chosen, don't fret. Miktopia has many wonderful jobs, manufacturing clothes, accessories, and beauty products. Holding a job in a factory is just as worthy of esteem as being an intoxibella. The mayor paused for cheers. He was met with dead silence. So the idea of the Day of Discovery is you'll have a limited amount of time to show off and try to impress the scouts so you can get into Model Land yourself. Now, going into this, I assumed that there was going to be like a stage and a runway and you have the contestants like line up and strut down the, the runway while you've got a couple of scouts on the edges looking on. No. That would make sense, you see. What you actually get is a confusing clusterfuck. Thousands of girls stampeded to the square all at once. Heels clacked, dresses swished, hairdos wobbled. The T-Dot theme song boomed a pulsating beat. There was one rule and one rule only. A girl must be walking in order to be chosen. Other than that, there was no prearranged runway on which the girls could walk. So everyone created invisible ones wherever they were standing. Violence was not encouraged, nor was it condemned, and some girls' parents insisted on adding martial arts training to their walking lessons in preparation for the big day. t Dodd's Square was an every man for himself, or more precisely, an every girl for herself event. Now go. Unleash hell. So instead of having any semblance of order, you've got this gaggle of contestants streaming over each other, oftentimes openly fighting in order to get attention from some scouts who are gonna 
Like, they're not even here yet. No, they show up after several minutes in a bizarre blaze of glory. Scouts? Where? Tookie stood on her tiptoes, her heart beating like mad. People stepped back from a nearby lamppost that had started to vibrate, staring at it with a mix of wonder and terror. The lamppost began to lengthen like a long telescoping pole. Snap! It broke apart and reassembled as a slender, mysterious-looking woman with a black metallic jumpsuit. Her head glowed as if it contained a light bulb. So, the scouts all wear weird clothes. That's the best way I can put it. I don't want to keep using the word weird, but honestly, that is the best descriptor for most of this book. And girls start getting selected from the crowd by multiple scouts until one eventually approaches the De La Creme family, takes one look at Miracle wearing her smize, and ignores her and moves to Tuki. Tuki, of course, is apprehensive about the selection at first, but ends up going along with it, at which point the scout just throws her into a sack. Trick or treat! Uh -huh. yeah! But it's not that the scouts pick up only one girl. They apparently pick up multiple, and this scout has to go off to another place called the Big Boutique Nation. And there's a girl working at a customer service counter in a large, effectively a very large mall named Dylan. Dylan's just manning a counter and uh, looking over apparently one of her little sisters when the scout approaches and offers uh, Dylan a chance at selection. Dylan accepts and gets thrown in the sack. Next stop is to the land of Candel Abra which is where they make candles. As ridiculous as this is, I do kind of like some of the stupid wordplay. It's like, it's not great, but it's the kind of stupid that you can still enjoy. In the land of Candel Abra, they run into Shiraz Shiraz, a very confident short girl who immediately jumps at the opportunity to uh, get selected. And she gets thrown in the sack. Now keep in mind, we are seeing examples of teleportaling, as the book refers to it, and yet it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like, the magic system examples of, of some of these powers gets lightly described, and I still don't know how to really picture it. Like, it's hard to get your head wrapped around all of the different variations that are going on. For example, this is how they teleport to the land of Sans Color. The pouch emerged into a sea of thin white strands. Some of them even entered the pouch, covering Tookie's head and drifting past her mouth. It tickled a little. Everyone started to giggle. What are we going to pop out of now? Dylan joked. A horse tail? Through the mesh wall of the pouch, Tookie saw a bear cave-sized hole and peeked in. Sticky, pasty gunk with peach fuzz was lodged inside. She frowned. I think we're inside an ear! How can we be inside ear? Shiraz frowned. Ear of giant? That make no sense. They are in fact inside of an ear and the pouch like swells up next to a pale skinned woman with long platinum locks screaming at the top of her lungs. An understandable reaction. Now the land of Sans Color uh, apparently has very high tech buildings that hover about two stories above the ground and that's because this land is plagued with creatures called the gizzards. They like to eat the citizens of Sans Color. Oh, yes, and as a brilliant play on words, Sans Color, uh, everyone there has albinism, including the princess named Piper, who gets selected, and even though the queen doesn't like this, Piper goes along with it, and Piper gets thrown into a sack. Hey, this is another one of those moments that's kind of like possibly unintentional clarity where there's a very clear exploitive image about a, a modeling scout throwing all these girls into a sack and flying off with them. I think Banks was just trying to be goofy, but the moment feels unintentionally poignant. Like, I don't know if that's what she was really going for because so much of this book is ridiculous. There's probably no real lessons to be learned from this, but maybe. But finally, after collecting the four girls, the scout leads them to the gates of Model Land, which are described as having blue and gold metal and deeply engraved silver that had big gears on both sides that seemed like some sort of high security locks. And they meet Guru Applauses, 
uh, which I am certain that I am mispronouncing, so I'm just going to call him Guru Applesauce. And he is a very good start to the kind of weird that you can expect in Model Land. Something shot toward them through the darkness. When Tookie's eyes adjusted, she saw a creature with a head shaped exactly like a human hand, with four fingers and a long thumb. The palm of the hand contained pale blue eyes, two holes for a nose, and two full lips. Below the strange hand head was the body of a normal human. Guru Applesauce, aside from being a teacher, is also the head of the Kocher department. And he is a very eccentric fellow. He is so excited at their lack of tardiness that he feels that they deserve a round of applause. With a squeal of pleasure, the creature leaned all the way to the left and hit his hand head to its left palm, and then did the same on the right side with its right palm. Just looking at this bizarre ovation made Tookie dizzy. He applauds people by slapping himself in the face. <laughs> I love that. This book is unabashedly and unapologetically bizarre. And despite its flaws, despite the writing errors, I gotta respect that. That's just, that's going full force ridiculous and embracing it. It's a good choice. It makes the book stand out. And because of that, I am enjoying myself as I read this. It's perfectly ridiculous. And I'm cool with that. But as the girls wait around the front gates of Model Land, their scout transforms, utilizing the chameleon power that sometimes gets mentioned. And it's revealed that their scout this entire time was actually the celebrated, renowned, mythical Intoxabella, CL. Now, CL is the last triple seven, which is a special type of seven seven that utilize that uh, she is able to use all seven Intoxabella powers. We never really see them utilized, with the exception of teleportaling and chameleon, but they're there, we promise. And then CL has a moment where she kind of freaks out when she sees the girls that she just picked up. Yes, I'm CL, the Intoxabella said, a calm, reluctant smile fluttering across her lips. She stared at Dylan, Piper, and Shiraz in amazement. It seemed like something clicked in her mind, and her expression totally changed from serene to something much darker. Hendel, Catherine, Woodland, I can't believe it! She ran up to Dylan and put her ear to Dylan's mouth. Then she moved to Shiraz and placed her fingers on her waist. Finally, she touched Piper's chest where her heart was. You all made it! Now, a moment later, she snaps out of it, and the crowd of girls she just recruited start going fangirl over her. And we don't really get an explanation for what that was until much later in the story. Take a shot! But other scouts start pouring in, bringing in other girls. Eventually, they total in a hundred uh, new Bellas, including Zarpesa. And all the other girls are stunning and well-dressed. They've got their makeup done properly. Uh, Dylan, Shiraz, and Piper, and Tookie, none of them were actually ready for the Day of Discovery, so they feel very out of place, and they bring up an old rumor that Model Land actually relies on sacrifices every year in order to keep the engines of the land running or something, I don't know. And because of this, they're worried that they're going to be sacrificed. They don't meet the beauty norms of Model Land. They're the outsiders, ergo, something's wrong. But we're not going to talk about that for now. Instead, we're going to get an introduction to Model Land itself. Now, CL has to go off and do something. So, Tuki and the gang are met by Zen Zen. Zen Zen is an upperclassman who introduces herself and is absolutely a fangirl of CL. And you'll almost never see Zen Zen after this, so okay. Unfortunately, there is a huge cast of characters for this story. And on one hand, that could be utilized well. A, a lot of the characters, like the tertiary characters, could lead to something else later in the series. But up until then, like, most of these blue notes are character introductions. And... A lot of them are underutilized. Like one character named Bo, who I'm not going to bother talking about because she doesn't do anything. Her main character trait is standing there looking unimpressed and not really responding to what's going on around her. That's her entire shtick. 
What's more central is what's going on with CL and why she has apparently lost some degree of respect within modeling, because she's not adored the way that a triple seven normally would be. Leia, what are you doing? Leia. Are you in the cupboard? <sighs> Stay here, stop getting in trouble. Nope, nope. And say hi to the internet. Obligatory cat moment. So CL is back at Model Land because she's being punished for being off message. What precisely that means, we don't really know yet. Zarpesa goes on to reveal my uncle's daughter's best friend's father's brother's nephew's cousin's designer buddy told me that the reason CL is back at Model Land is because she's being punished for being off message. And she is, and that is something that she brings up multiple times, like CL brings up multiple times later on. It's a big thematic thing within the book itself, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Zen Zen reveals such things as uh, the Orb Arena, where pretty boys and gorgeous girls battle in Man Attack, the one class they'll have with the brother male modeling academy, Bestosterone. But why male models? You serious? I just, I just told you that a moment ago. Right. There's also one of the main administrative buildings known as the M building. The entire golden area in front of the M building is called the M Plaza, she recited. The M building houses the Belladonna and all of the Model Land administration and who knows what else. One must never go inside unless explicitly invited. And right next to that is the O, which stands for the Opera. But before the tour can continue, an alarm goes off. And that's the signal that they all need to run back to the O. They're far enough away that Tookie might not be able to make it. But fortunately, salvation comes in the form of a zipper. The music in the O swelled. The hideously screeching buzzer was almost a continuous noise. Tookie was running out of time. She whipped around, considering trying a different path, but she was met by another wall of zippers behind her. Unfastened zippers. Zippers on the diagonal. She turned around once more. There was another wall of zippers. She was surrounded. Now the only thing Tookie could see was the sky. A flock of rainbow-colored birds flew overhead, seemingly flapping in the direction of the music. Fortunately, CL comes up at that uh, just the right moment and tells Tookie which zipper to open up and jump inside of in order to get to the O on time. It's now or never, Tookie, she thought, and tumbled in. Immediately, she got the sense that she was sliding down, down, down. Screams echoed in her ears. After a moment, she realized they were hers. Stop overreacting, CL's voice echoed off the walls. We're just in the zip zap. We'll be there in a second. I can't tell you how the zip zap works. It's not like a portal where you go from point A to point B instantly. It's like you jump in and then you fall a little bit and there you are. I have been falling for 30 minutes. There's even one point where they go into a zip zap that has a fork in the road and they go down one it's the wrong way, so they get back in, and they go the other direction. Like, did they go up and down, or... I don't know. I'm thinking about it in physical properties, and I don't think that's the way you're supposed to think about it. It's an idea that gets scant description, and I can't really make sense of it, so you gotta stop thinking about it very quickly. But Tookie makes it just in time as the ceremony starts and we get an introduction for Bestosterone. The music roared to a crescendo. All girls turned to the front. Something momentous was about to begin. The music changed abruptly to a funky military march. An authoritative female announcer then boomed, Welcome our protectors, our masons, and the best accessories since the tongue stud. <laughs> oh my. We also get the six members of the board, which include Guru Applesauce. And then the Belladonna leads everyone in a really weird song. From footwear to freeze sprays, foundation face powders, to corsets and camisoles and culottes and trousers, moccasins and miniskirts, mesh tops and bronzers, sandals, suspenders, and sunblock with powers. None of those rhymed. This is awful. There's a lot to it. This actually goes on for several pages. I'm not reading all of it. And the Belladonna 
uh, which I'm sorry, I'm going to unintentionally misinformation because there's 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 so much going on. It is even with all of my notes, it's difficult to keep track. The Belladonna is a real person, but doesn't like to appear in public. So here is being portrayed by a statue. Think Weeping Angel. You've got the right idea. Anyway, the Belladonna finishes off the weird song thing with uh, kind of a dire warning for the Thigh High Boot Camp, THBC, that's coming up. Your premature merriment has come much too fast. Disparity between good and bad will be very vast. THBC separates the punks from the class. For some no sees Discovery Day will be your last. And that only solidifies the uh, worry that the girls have about getting sacrificed. And we get multiple new characters all at once as the girls start intermingling with the rest of the uh, no sees the new group that were all brought in with the scouts. Uh, like Kamalini Dara from Chakra. There's also the Likey sisters. Uh, she Likey, Her Likey, I Likey, and Me Likey from Mini Paul. Angelica from Iceland, who I don't remember at all. Zorpesa gets uh, a toady named uh, Chaste, who is very not chaste. If this book had a single problem that it needed to fix, it would be that it overloads the reader. Consider how much that we've actually gone over so far and consider how far we are into the book. About 550 pages, we're on page 182 right now. Actually going by so fast, I can barely keep up with my notes. The entire class jumps into a zip zap and they're teleported directly to Thigh High Boot Camp. And this is to uh, remove the wheat from the chaff. It is taught by Gonero Nars, or Guru Gonero, who is described as a stunning three-quarter man, one-quarter woman guru. Thigh High Boot Camp is done in multiple stages. The, the way that it's approached is you gotta pass the class or you can leave out the well-marked exit sign and go back home and abandon your dreams of ever living in Model Land ever again. And the first is a lesson on how to apply makeup. So you've got all these lipsticks and glosses and eyeliners and foundations and whatnot and not really a lot of uh, brushes to go around. So, and as he's instructed, he gets all the girls to sit around. They've got uh, their own mirrors and all these different uh, types of makeups. And as they start, they begin, um, you know, with one type of applicant and then they, you know, pass the tools on over to the next girl and, you know, they start applying the makeup themselves. And a number of you in the audience who actually know anything about makeup are probably saying, wait, they passed? everything over like you're using the same eyeliner brush yes they are in fact and you're right that is kind of gross that's the core of the lesson don't share makeup supplies so it's not actually a mistake because the girls aren't really paying attention to what they're doing until they look at their reflections once they're done applying all their makeup and this is where the nightmare mirrors come in suddenly shiraz's eyes bulged tookie shiraz wailed pointing shakily at her what's happening Tookie turned to see what Shiraz was pointing to. An older, unrecognizable person was staring at Tookie. It had a boil growing on its nose, letting out a smoke that smelled of rotten eggs and animal droppings. Much of its hair had fallen out in clumps, and many of the hanging strands had fused together into what looked like chunks of petrified wood. Its eyes were bruised, swollen nearly shut, and its ears were swollen into what looked like bulbs of cauliflower. Oh my god, Tookie and the creature whispered. That was when she realized. The gruesome creature was her. And the descriptions just get worse from that as all of the girls notice that their reflections are these nightmarish creatures. The, the idea is so alarming that several girls in the class just leave out the exit door immediately and go for home. But Tookie decides to stick with her friends and they go through the rest of the trials, which really don't remember, like, I don't remember them too well. Honestly, they don't stand out very much. One At one point, they're dodging, like, a giant sewing needle. And I think that really says something about it, like, if I can't remember the other events. But eventually, they do manage to pass Thigh High Boot Camp. That's really just the rough orientation introduction to life in Model Land. And because of that, they get to get assigned a dorm room and start classes 
in Model Land the next day. Before they get to the dorms, though, Zen Zen is out front waiting to greet the uh, group of girls that were from her tour group, and she says, Admiring the D, are you? Ha <laughs> ha! Dangly parts. Zen Zen also confirms that uh, Guru Ganero is one of the teachers. Bellas get their walking lessons from him. And this kind of confirms that Guru Gonero uh, is actually based on Miss J, who was one of the consultants from America's Next Top Model, who also taught how to properly walk down a runway. It's our runway diva coach extraordinaire, Miss J. So I'm guessing the three quarters man, one quarter woman thing was a joke, like an inside joke between the two of them, I am assuming and I don't care enough to actually investigate that. The rooms themselves are pretty blank once you get inside, but if you stand in the right place, your bed actually forms like it's sketched in via pencil outline and then it kind of fades into existence. I swear, I want to see this book turn into a movie just so I can see some of the visuals. We also learned that for some reason, Model Land tells time by color, not number. And hey, you're ready for another over-analytical diatribe because this is weird. Examples of the use of color to tell time include things like Midnight Blue, Goldenrod, and Kelly Green. If I were to overanalyze this moment, we could look, uh, take a look at how language is a tool to communicate ideas, but if we separate commonality, add in words where they don't make sense, refer to things using different definitions, or just make things up, then we lose that ability to communicate and understand one another. This isn't like how America uses empirical me uh, imperial measurements while Europe uses metric and then never lands on the moon. <laughs> because both those means use numbers to get their ideas across, and there's a way of calculating differences. With Model Land intentionally using a completely different standard like this, using colors instead of numbers, they intentionally separate themselves from everybody else in the world. This blatant isolationism seen through the lens of how they only allow the best products and candidates to even enter their domain strikes at a very high sort of elitism. The people running Model Land are so full of themselves that they insist on standing out however they can, including something banal like telling time. Using numbers to tell time makes sense, but how does one shade of color blending to another accurately tell you the advancement of time? How would one, uh, how would it work for the colorblind? This isn't as simple as learning how to convert values. This sounds so alien that you'd have to completely relearn how to tell time. This is one of those weird world building moments where it's, that's a little deeper than you might think at first glance and while absurd does show a degree of thought from the author. Although I cannot confirm that that's intentional thought and again, I could be over analyzing it. Maybe Banks just wanted to go with color because it's prettier. All of the new students are also told that they are allowed to keep only two things from home because starting tomorrow, it's gonna be all model and stuff and only the best stuff. So, you know, not too many like old clothes or souvenirs allowed. Tookie chooses to keep her diary, the T-mail jail as she calls it, and the Tookie pin that she got from Theophilus Lovelace. And that night as they're going to sleep, we also discover that there are these weird lamps that kind of shine over them while they sleep. It's called a Lumiere. Lumiere, Shiraz repeated. Zarpeza tilted her chin toward the light as though it were a sun lamp. The Lumiere is a special light that shines on Bellas at night. It's whatever their most flattering light is. Candlelight, sunlight, whatever. And look, mine's a spotlight. It means I'm going to be a superstar in Toxabella. My pow pow powers are right around the corner. I'm going to be a quadruple seven bigger than CL. Now, having a light shining on you while you're trying to sleep sounds like a terrible idea. The book Zarpeza claims that it keeps your skin fresh and dewy. I have no idea if that's true, and I don't care enough to look it up. I do know that excess light actually distracts you and makes falling asleep harder. Damn you, Thomas Edison. And staying up later will just make your skin sag, so I don't know how bullshit this is. But in the middle of the night, Tookie gets up, it turns out she has a sleepwalking problem, and she uncovers a, a lone figure in a room flogging herself and the figure uh flogging herself is you know begging saying i'm so sorry i'm so sorry tookie gasped never having heard such a horrible sound the figure in the room stiffened at the noise and raised its head and suddenly tookie caught sight of who it was it was a face she 
and all the world knew very, very well. CL. What could this possibly be building to? The next morning, Tookie wakes up in her bed, and uh, she and all the other students wake up and go to the bathroom, but Tookie has a sudden pain in her stomach and then doubles over as if she's about to vomit. And then all the other girls do too. At once, every single girl in the bathroom doubled over in pain, gripping her stomach and back just as Tookie had. As Tookie is walking to class the next day, she runs into a Piper, who reveals every new Bella started menstruating at the same time this morning. It's later revealed that this is the technological ability of Model Land. They have the ability to sync up periods all at once in the span of a night. This place is evil. I read somewhere that their periods attract bears. The bears can smell the menstruation. But Tookie has her classroom assignments. She's got Kara Kara Kara, then Runaway Intensive, and then Mastication. But along the way, she and Piper run into a couple of boys from uh, Bestosterone. One of them is named Bravo, and he immediately gives Tookie a degree of attention. Quite unusual, all things considered. Tookie freezes up, not just because a guy is talking to her, but also because an attractive guy is talking to her. We're building this new 7-7 stadium for you, Bravo went on, gesturing to the site. A couple of years ago, a huge fireball decimated the old stadium. It came out of nowhere, from the other side of the wall. Some people say the spirits over there get pissed at us sometimes and want to burn Model Land down. But we can't let that plot point sink in, so it's off to Kara 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 class, which is apparently some made-up language which translates to face face face. It's on a boat. The boat looks like a shark. This will culminate in a joke. It's being taught by another eccentric guru called Guru Pacifico Cruz from the land of Texacoco. And Guru Cruz announces that there is a reason why Model Land has synced up everyone's periods. Why do we do this? Well, Bellas, the life of a model is one of great adventure and many challenges. Model Land tolerates no excuse for tardiness or for faulty or missed assignments. Come hell or high agua, an intoxibella must be ready to shine, to model through mayhem and mishaps, to perform, to be the very best, no excuses. So today your training begins. Hencio, your Tia Flow is happening right now, yes? How well can you project an image that is opposite of how you are feeling or at odds with your surroundings? And so suddenly the classroom looking like it's inside a shark makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Shark week. It's a bad week. So face, face, face class is not about makeup. It's about how you express yourself, like how you manage your expression while you're working. So it's basically acting, but Guru Cruz puts in this comment about actresses and it feels like there's a joke, like an inside joke between models and actresses. I don't know if it's an inside joke, but that's how it reads. But fail, and you may be relegated to spending your life as, heaven forbid, an actress. The guru said this last word in a low, disgusted whisper. Actresses are incapable of opposite performing. They must think about sad times in their lives to project sadness on the silver screen. Nonsense! Yes, it is kind of nonsense. That's kind of what they're talking about doing in this class, by putting on an uh, opposite expression of how you really feel. That's it's kind of acting. And the class goes uneventfully until the masthead of the class uh, gets possessed or something by the Belladonna, who announces, This cycle you had this morning will be the last period you will ever have for the rest of your lives. Now that might raise a number of questions like, are they all sterile all of a sudden? Well, no. Apparently the only thing they lost is they just don't have periods or cramps anymore. Now this does kind of come up later on, and I don't want to spoil it, so put a pin in this one for now. The next class is the Runaway instructional class, walking a runway, and it is taught by uh, Guru Nars. But he's not the only teacher. Uh, in a sudden decision that happens like as the students have already entered, he has to co-lead the class alongside CL. And this chapter reveals something. It, it kind of hints at it in the previous one with the face, face, face class, but this is where it really solidifies something and I'm confused by what it's trying to get across. Everyone has to walk down a runway a particular way and look fabulous doing it, but there's a trick to it. You see, the Centuras, the magic belts that they're all wearing, 
they have a certain trick that allow the Bellas to look a little more graceful than they really are. So, no sees, you idiots all know that fashion shows appear calm, smooth, and orderly when spectators view them, Gonero explained. And models appear to be dressed by human dressers who aid and abet them into multiple outfits one after the other. That's just how everyone sees it, but that's not how it really plays out. Your centauras hold the power to hypnotize the audience, whether that's the fashion auditorium or watching a recording in the privacy of their own master bedrooms. It shows them what Model Land wants them to see. This is the most important class you will ever take in Model Land. So, does that mean that any initial talent that any of the models actually have is pointless because the belt's doing all the work? Grace isn't taught, it's edited in. I don't understand why we've got a, a completely, almost entirely unutilized magic system, belts that do everything, while classes also teach everything. It's like the classes aren't geared as far as how to utilize the belt. It's not like how to use a wand in Hogwarts. The, the entire setup makes so little sense. Hello, you. Are you done crawling around in the cabinet? The book doesn't seem to really know what it wants the reader to really take away from this. Like, how much work does the belt do? How much work does it take for the model to learn how to utilize the belt? How much of a, of a tool is the belt? These are questions that are never answered. And the way it's set up, I'm not sure that these are questions we're supposed to be asking in the first place. It's like a matter of happenstance. Like, if you took out the belt entirely, then the classes would make so much more sense. It would make so much more sense on why you've got to learn how to walk down a runway the right way or how to keep your expression a certain way instead of relying on the belt to trick the audience. It's like, that just renders everything they're doing redundant. When you are building a magic system, you've got to go through and make sure that not only does the magic system make sense, but it's being utilized in a way that makes sense. You can't just have a magic system and not have the world built around that magic system. They've actually got to intertwine pretty smoothly. Uh, a good example of this, I believe this was a video by The Closer Look who actually uh, gave a good lesson on Bra uh, Brandon Sanderson's uh, depth not width magic systems argument. There's a level in Skyrim, a, a city called Markarth. It's the worst city in the game. It's absolutely horrible. Um, and one of the main quest lines in the city eventually lands you in prison, unjustly. And you've got a couple of ways you can get through the prison and, and escape. But one of the things that you can do, that I prefer to do, is you build a magic character and then you start summoning things inside the prison so they can slaughter the other prisoners and you just find the key on one of their corpses and get out that way. That kind of ruins the immersion because now you've got a prison system that doesn't account for anybody being able to utilize magic. And magic's not like this rare ability. You start the game knowing how to shoot fire out of your hands. It like, doesn't even matter what your character is. You start with that skill. And you run into plenty of bad guys who know how to use magic too. It's actually a fascinating argument. I'll link uh, his video down in the description as well. Actually, while I'm on the uh, topic of small things that don't really make sense in the world, one of the things that CL is confirmed to be able to do is use the chameleon powers to change how she looks. She utilized that when she changed from a scout back to her regular self at the gates of Model Land. And yet, despite that, she is demonstrating the runway walk where she comes down the walkway in one set of clothes and goes back, walks around behind a curtain real quick and, but you know, like within seconds, is in a completely different outfit. And the easiest explanation is, oh, she just used her magic powers to transform within a few seconds. Well, no, apparently that's bizarre and Tookie wonders, and she changed outfits so quickly, how? Like, we've already got an answer for this. Now, the reason given is because clothes flew off CL and disintegrated. New clothes appeared and dozens of tiny hands pulled them over her head and down her body. Everything happened at a rapid pace, like a pit stop at a car race in the city of 500. So I understand why there would be an automated system for 
models who don't have the chameleon powers, but to have Tookie ask this question in order to serve the plot, to help the world building, to make Tookie momentarily dumb just doesn't work on a character building level. Instead, she should have utilized the knowledge that she did have and say, oh, CL must have been using her chameleon powers, just like we saw her do before. Very cool. And then they all walk backstage, reveal that that's not what happened, and there you go. A little bit of world building, and, and all of a sudden, Tookie realizes she's wrong. You get the world building, you get a little bit of a character moment that's, that maintains consistency. I don't know. The, the, the book is loaded with small world building moments like that that don't really stack up. But then we get to the best class, the mastication class. Yes. It's about food. And the building for the classroom looks like a giant bowl. Tookie finally found the site of mastication class. The building was a giant bowl made up of multicolored bricks with a ladle-shaped smokestack poking out the top. As she got closer, Tookie could see that the bricks were actually loaves of wheat, white, pumpernickel, and raisin bread. Butter and cream cheese served as grout. Beef and chicken kebabs provided additional building support and the windows seemed effervescent, like they were carbonated. Tookie stuck out her tongue to lick the window, and uh, Dylan walks up to warn her to not do that, and uh, apparently trying to eat the building gets you shocked. The class is also taught by perhaps the friendliest of the gurus. The guru grabbed another jerky, then hopped off the desk. Good day. the name is Lauro Brown. Guru Lauro to you. She had an accent from Didgeridoo, a hot land full of beaches and unusual animals with strange names. Now, Guru Loro reveals that she has a unique power. She is a tongue reader. Loro adjusted her hat. Because I, mate, am a tongue reader. I can tell what all your tastes are at all times. Reading tongues for me is like reading palms. I know what you want, when you want it, when your tummy's happy, and she pointed, uh, she pointedly eyed the likeys when it's sad. You're all very hungry right now, aren't you? Now, Loro leads them to a room of f uh, showers that instead of dispensing water, dispense various forms of uh, food, like uh, marshmallow fluff, caramel, boysenberry. Pretty sure there's a chocolate uh, shower as well. The girls rush to the showers, all except the likeys who stood on the sidelines sucking their mints. Chase checked to make sure the guru wasn't watching, then knocked down a brunette girl as she gunned for the dark chocolate shower. Toki ran over the fallen brunette, scooped her up, and then made a break for the salted caramel stream, cupping her hands under the faucet and burying her face in her palms. Zorpesa stuck her mouth under a maple syrup spray, but the, her shower head jammed as it forced out broken bits of pecan pralines. Letting out a frustrated wail, she ripped the fixture from the wall, allowing a solid stream of maple pecan praline sauce to flow directly into her wide-open mouth. Now what's unusual is that Zorpesa has been bullying Tookie uh, occasionally throughout the book. Uh, one of the examples is that she cut up a dress and replaced Tookie's uh, cintura belt so that Tookie wasn't really performing that well in the runway class. You know, trying to walk around using a fake belt. And part of this is because Zarpesa knows that Tookie knows that Zarpesa was dumpster diving for food. And this was a really embarrassing moment for Zarpesa and is a point of contention that she has against Tookie, trying to, you know, bully Tookie so that Tookie won't talk. And despite that, we still get moments when Guru Loro uh, does a tongue reading and reveals Zarpesa's weakness for a particular type of food. Then she turned to Zarpesa. Hmm, Loro murmured, looking at Zarpesa's tongue. White truffle wagyu saffron risotto topped with almas caviar. Right, I'm obsessed, Zarpesa yelled. Our private chef prepares it when I'm not dining out at Le Dooley. Oh, but wait, sweetie, there's something else I'm seeing. Zarpesa's face quivered. What? A blend of discarded foods, room temperature, slightly decaying, puzzling, very much Doro, uh, Daru food, mate. Daru? Dylan whispered to Tuki. Tuki hesitated but decided she would translate. Daru means homeless in the didgeridoo dialect. So it's not just that she was outed by the teacher, but Loro actually removes her chef's hat and sprays this fine yellow smoke uh, throughout the, the room, which reveals the girl's favorite uh, foods and favorite flavors. And that's when Zarpesa, of her own volition, announces, 
No, it smells like virgin olive oil bread with only a slight hint of mold, which is okay because it can be sliced off, and a half-eaten pheasant. Sarpesa swooned before stopping herself. And despite this, no one ever comes up to her later and say, Sarpesa, it's really weird that you admitted that you enjoyed eating olive oil bread with mold on it. Now, I like the, the tension between Zarpesa and Tuki because on multiple occasions, Tuki is given a chance to out Zarpesa's secret and uh, really knock her down a few pegs, which at this point Zarpesa desperately deserves. But Tuki decides not to because she doesn't want to sink to Zarpesa's level. A bit of advice that CL gave Tuki early in the uh, book is, you know, you, you never really know what other people are suffering through. Don't sink to their level. She says it in a weird way, but... The girl who is sucking your blood is hurting way more than you. Never stoop to her level. It's a good lesson, but having Zarpesa outed like this and then having nobody react to it seems like you're hamstringing the lesson. And unfortunately, that's not the only place where the rivalry between Zarpesa and Tuki falters, but we'll get to that later. So the girls are all given labels to describe how they eat. They could be jammers, showers, poachers, any number of things. Tookie herself is a gut jammer. Then she approached Tookie. A red stamp marred Tookie's hand. Gut jammer. You ate with the voraciousness of a pregger's Tasmanian devil during her first trimester. We get it, you're from space, Australia! But Laurel reveals that she is the one who's going to be preparing most of their food in the cafeteria. And she opens up a door and reveals the cafeteria is labeled Eats. I get it, Tookie said. M is Model Land, O is Opera, D is Dorms, and E is Eats. Zarpesa interrupted sarcastically. Wow, you're so brilliant. Dylan narrowed her eyes. There has to be an L, Tookie said, ignoring Zarpesa. Yes, the buildings in this place slowly spell out Model Land. And don't expect to find out what the rest of those are that's the last you hear of it. And it's not even that, like, we needed to get the rest of that, like, spelled out to find out what all the buildings are. It's just that the idea started and then stopped as soon as it was confirmed. We don't get to see the rest of it play out, so the whole thing just feels really disappointing. Like, is that actually what they were going for? If that's the case, what are the rest of the letters? Why was O for opera and not the orb arena? Why do some buildings apparently qualify and others don't? I don't know. The, the whole thing, it doesn't work. Like, the idea starts and then just... It doesn't work. After the girls have eaten lunch, I guess, they get summoned by Persimmon, who is the manicant servant of the Belladonna herself. They're taken to a new building called the Uwa, which is not in the... Spelling of Model Land, again. This is basically the spa. It has all sorts of different uh, treatments to help models relax, uh, massage, sauna, stuff like that. For more of the emotional therapy, though, they have what are called the Flashback Females. This is a room with a couple of women with their hair tied up all together. They, they can project the past. It's kind of like the reverse of uh, Minority Report with the... Um, where were those called? Anyway, for some reason, it takes three people to step inside of their room and in order for the powers to work. I don't know why, but it's a way for them to view pretty much anything from the past. They have the ability to take a person to a time in her life that has already happened. You cannot change the past, only witness it. Most Bellas find it very therapeutic. You can take your friends with you into your flashback, and they will see and hear everything that happened also. But if one of you wants to do it, your whole group must follow. The door is sealed once someone has stepped into the circle, trapping everyone inside, no exceptions. And that, of course, leads to many questions. How do they actually perceive things? Is it generated from the person's point of view? Or do they actually see it third person? Why do they need to have the whole group go in? In this particular case, I'm assuming it's because Dylan, Camelini, and Tuki are all just part of one group that Persimmon wants to keep together. But that's an assumption. Honestly, this is technology that should be shared with the police because think of the crimes you could solve if you actually had a suspect 
that you wanted to investigate. Just take them into the flashback females, relive particular moments, and there you go. You know if they're guilty or not. Now, what's really weird is Dylan is very enthusiastic about this idea. She tries to hype the others into joining her because she wants to watch something in the past, I guess. And this is what I don't understand. We're not given any limitations on what they could see. The things they witness are entirely of their own volition. And yet, Kamalini remembers a time where her mother was a director or something, working on a movie set. Kamalini invited her friends to visit uh, the movie set, and uh, there was an accident. Betty, get ready to cue the dancers, Kamalini's mother shouted to her. Just as Maya, the youngest Pande, was about to say the last line of the scene, another ear-splitting sound thundered above. The heavy sky-blue backdrop tipped and plummeted to the ground. Everyone screamed and scattered, but for some it was too late. Thick white dust poured all around like smoke. Tookie waved her hand in front of her face, trying to see. Suddenly, a keening cry rang out. Maya crawled out from under the rubble, blood streaming down her forehead. Ma! Papa! Nani! Now these were friends of Kamalini's when she was a kid, so she witnessed and is the reason why some of her friends died in a movie set. And it doesn't get much better. Uh, there was Dylan, who was the one who wanted to do all this, and the vision she got to see was uh, one day when Dylan and her father were visiting the park. Suddenly Dylan's father started to cough. He seemed unable to catch his breath. His face became bright red, and then he dropped to the ground. Daddy, little Dylan cried, hovering over him. Daddy, what's wrong? Her father looked at her with glassy eyes. His mouth opened and closed, but he couldn't speak. In seconds, a big boutique ambulance roared up, and EMTs jumped out and loaded Dylan's father into a stretcher. Daddy! Young Dylan cried again and again. A few moments later, the girls returned to the Ua. Dylan lay on the floor, sobbing. Tookie's vision is entirely different from the others, though. Hers takes place while she was an infant. Mr. De La Creme gently touched his baby daughter's head, her hair a mix of textures that seemed deliberate, not random and haphazard. Six teeth already, Dumplin'? You're jumping the gun. You're gonna need one of these soon. He handed her a toddler-sized toothbrush. Young Tookie grabbed the toothbrush and bit on it. Mr. De La Creme turned to his wife and smiled. Look at her. She's strong, just like her daddy. And she looks just like me, doesn't she? You wish. Mrs. De La Creme playfully smacked him on his muscular arm. My Tookie is the spitting image of her mommy. So I think the idea that is being played around with here is you're, you're given a vision of some traumatic time in your life so that you can view it again and try to get over it. You know, try to use that to heal. The pain is part of the process, as uh, Persimmon says at one point. It doesn't work that way. The problem is, at no point is that actually confirmed. That's an assumption that I'm making based on how it was utilized. Otherwise, like, a whole lot of this doesn't make sense. If it was meant just to relive traumatic episodes, well, there are certain things that you're not going to really be able to witness without it kind of messing you up a little, to say the least. That is the scariest fucking thing I have ever seen in my entire life. And yet Dylan was entirely enthusiastic about it. It's like, hey guys, let's go into the thingy that will let us relive horrible traumas, like when my father died right in front of me when I was five! That's brilliant. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. But it can't all be just traumatic moments if Tookie got a rather pleasant moment of her parents actually being loving and affectionate. You do have some degree of input that you can give here. Tuki approached the female, the flashback females, and said, please just show me something good from my life, anything, even if it's something I can't remember. And then they showed her something nice. So why would you willingly say, hey, let me remember the time that I got my friends crushed under a backdrop right in front of me? It doesn't make sense for the characters in this situation to want to relive these situations. There's no impetus leading up to this. There's no reason why, like, Camelini hasn't apparently been mourning the loss of her friend from, I don't know, 10 years or so ago. Uh, there's no reason why Dylan has been missing her father and just wanted to see her again, even if it was 
uh, watching him die again. This scene is just in here for expositional purposes. It could have worked. It could have served as a purpose like, oh, well, let me relive the time I won the spelling bee or uh, the time I got that part in the play in second grade or something like that. Speaking of stupid decisions, we actually have a group that are undergoing what's called the Pilgrim's Plague. You see, the want to join Modeland is so severe in some people that they will actually decide to climb the mountain in order to get up there. Otherwise, the only way to get there is by flying, by teleportaling. There is a path that leads up there, but it's fraught with danger and has a 100% fatality rate. But some people are just, you know, struck with this weird mix of anxiety and sadness and they really want to join model land because they're just so super special and they got to point it out to everybody and so against all logic they're going to climb the mountain which also involves trekking along the diabolical divide and among this group are miracle and creamy yes they are not done with the story yet now the problem is we don't know precisely when this group leaves we're told that the trip up the mountain would take several months Keep in mind, an average round trip uh, up and down Mount Everest would take about two months. And yet, chronologically, we don't know precisely where they are here. Uh, like, is this taking place the day after uh, the Day of Discovery? Because, I mean, that's what it seems to be. Especially because the next chapter opens up by saying, Our most unusual tale picks up at the start of the next model and Quadmester, three months and four days later. So, if this is chronological, the climb up a mountain takes longer than three months, making the mountain apparently much taller or much harder to climb than Everest. I mean, harder to climb certainly because there are monsters and stuff, but like physically, I don't know how that would work. Tookie also has a class called Gust Gape, which teaches them how to keep their eyes open even in extreme winds, which is an oddly specific class. It's like having an English class dedicated solely to the use of semicolons. Tookie's going about her day and runs into Bravo, who is still doing construction work hauling logs around. Uh, tries flexing in front of her to impress her and accidentally gets some wood chips thrown in her face. So he tries to help her out. Then Bravo lightly patted Tookie's hair clean of dust and gingerly plucked a piece of a small shard of wood stuck to her bottom lip. His thumb touched both of her lips, then entered her mouth just a bit. He removed the last traces of chipped wood, but his thumb lingered between her lips and made slight contact with her tongue. The flirting in this book is really weird. Tookie's next class is War of Words, taught by Guru Matt Joe Von Megalo. And this class is to teach Bellas how to use words to convince, to charm, to soothe, and to strike and destroy the arguments of anyone standing in your way. And I think it's rather telling that the instructor teaching this class sucks at talking. Now, where was I? The class. Yep, yep. This is War of Words. In your previous lives, you may have called it debate. Today, I will begin by observing your natural skills, and from there, I will mold your use of language so that you are, um, skilled artisans. Bellas, this is, um, the most important class you'll ever take at Model Land. Why? Well, as in Toxabellas, you must master the art of speaking about the products you were hired to represent. Yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Nope, nope, nope. You must clearly convey your love and use of them, whether you adore the, the item or actually detest it. The job of an Intoxabella is not necessarily to love the products you sell, but to make your public become enamored with them. And as part of her punishment, CL joins the class, but not as an instructor this time. She has been bumped down to the rank of no C, so she's on the same level as Tuki. And that is despite that uh, CL was a natural when she took this class the first time. Now, as part of the debate, Tuki and Dylan are set up against Zarpesa and CL debating about the standards of beauty norms uh, as they exist in Model Land. The topic for this last debate is going to be the unusual physicality versus defined beauty. One team will argue atypical features are superior to conventional beauty, and the other will argue for narrowly defined beauty and that anything else is absolutely worthless. Like the kind of defining they do at Model Land, how subtle.
everybody sucks in this debate because no one really argues for what they're supposed to argue for. Tookie kind of goes off on a ramble about how CL is wasting her time about you know, like this weird crusade combating beauty norms. And Dylan freaks out because she doesn't consider herself beautiful and actually has an emotional moment and runs out of the class. So Tuki, Piper, and Shiraz all go after her. And that is where they discover the Catwalk Corridor, which Dylan, I guess, ran through. Look, okay, this part gets really stupid. So Catwalk Corridor, instead of being like a stage where you practice runway walks or something, it's literally filled with cats. This is a punishment room where if you're being really catty, you get transformed into a cat and you're sent to live there for a little while. For some reason, Zarpesa and Chaste follow them in there and Zarpesa gets peed on. But unfortunately, uh, as part of their attempt to get through Catwalk Corridor, uh, the girls are attacked and uh, Tookie gets bitten. The cats ran towards the lion face and jumped into its golden eye sockets. As the Daisy Ellen-faced Abyssian jumped through one of the openings, she yelled, Watch out, De La Creme. This kitty cat got a taste of your sweetness and wants more of your cream. Back off! She's a minor! Now, this chapter and the next are also part of a continuing issue throughout the book. About halfway through the story, Zarpesa stops being a bully and becomes more of a target of mockery by the author. She was something of a threat, uh, to Tuki, but it's like Banks just changed her mind and decided that Zarpesa is now going to be the object of her ire, and so every once in a while Zarpesa is bullied herself, or is the victim of karmic justice. Like, there was no reason for her to be in the catwalk corridor at all, and yet there she goes running in there, I guess after Tuki, just to get attacked by cats and peed on. And the next scene is where they go to the hospital, where Zarpesa gets shot down by Bravo again. All of the threat that she used to represent, just gone, because the author apparently doesn't feel like utilizing her as she used to be. If Banks wanted Zarpesa to have a redemption arc and learn the error of her ways, or something like that, fine, but we don't get that kind of a scene. Instead, Zarpesa's utilization within the story just completely shifts. And I cannot find a reason why that might have been, at least within the story. Now, she's still obnoxious and a brat, but she's not the intimidating bully figure that she used to be. Here's probably the worst part about the Catwalk Corridor scene. It's completely arbitrary. You can cut it and you lose nothing. They don't run into Dylan there, and there's not even that much in the way of signs that she was there. The reason that scene was there is because Banks wanted to include a scene where you had a bunch of bottles that were turned into cats. Isn't that funny? No. Some places like the Catwalk Corridor don't serve the story much. In a stronger narrative, all locations serve a purpose while displaying a lot of world building. Lord of the Rings does this excellently. The Mines of Moria have a tragic history and serve the plot because the heroes needed to walk through it as part of their journey. Rivendell is a beautiful haven and testimony to the elves and served as a rest stop for the heroes. Catwalk Corridor only fits in because it led to Tookie going to the hospital, which could have been done in any other number of ways, like how Shiraz apparently has to go there every day as part of her routine treatments. Routine treatments, which by the way, are not actually mentioned until they're on their way to the hospital. Oh my God, this story jumps all over the bloody place. It's so hard to keep track of what's going on. Dylan's actually in her dorm room where Tookie, Piper, and Shiraz eventually find her and, you know, console her. Everyone has a heart to heart about uh, their own inner problems. Tookie actually has, at one point she wrote a letter to herself talking about how much she hated herself and please hurry up and end it, just go for all of us. Like, it's really revealing, it's really depressing, it's kind of shoehorned in, if I'm being honest. But this conversation does bring all the girls closer and they decide to form their own little group called the Unicas because they're all unique. But they can't celebrate too long because, well, 
Tookie is still injured from the walk in the catwalk corridor, so they need to go to the emergency, uh, the fashion emergency department store, or FEDS, which is a hospital. That makes so much sense! Like I mentioned before, the attendees at the hospital are types of creatures called purses, and they are born with roller skates for feet because it allows them to move around faster. How does that work? What does it actually look like? Stop asking questions! It's a neat idea! That's all you really need, apparently! And we meet Purse Dress to Kill. Gods, what a stupid name. And Dr. Erica. And if you've ever been a fan of Two Point Hospital or Theme Hospital, you may be amused by some of the treatments in this scene. Uh, some of the conditions are very similar. For example, one girl has a condition called flooding pants. I washed my uniform in super hot water today, she explained. They told us to only wash it in cold, but it was so stinky from Runaway Intensive 201, I had to. When I took it out of the wash, it was tiny, tiny. My D-mates told me to turn it in for a new one, but I was late for history of model and classes, so I just threw this on. All of a sudden, I was submerged in water. I felt like I was going to drown. Now I can't get the uniform off, and the floods have been happening like clockwork. I can't swim, and I can only hold my breath for... And then her pants, like, start flooding with water again. I mean, this book is perfectly absurd, but some of the imagination that comes in here does make me laugh. We also come across Desperata, a background character who has been popping up every once in a while. Her singular personality trait is that she is constantly crying. Well, she gets officially diagnosed with BW, boy withdrawal. She misses her boyfriend from back home. I don't need it. I don't need it. I definitely don't need it. I this is also the scene that we reveal why some of the citizens of Model Land have certain abnormalities that normal humans don't. It seems like there are a lot of, um, different looking gurus around here, Tuki said softly, thinking of Guru Applesauce and its hand head and Guru Pacifico with his rubber face. That's because hundreds of years ago, Model Land took us all in, the doctor explained, her hands moving quickly over Tuki's sliced ankle and then her lips. Anyone born different. We would be locked up and tested on without this place. If it weren't for Model Land, my kind and others like me would be freaks, like her, she said, referring to Purse Dressed to Kill, who passed by the, out the corridor outside. All I'll say is, that's a... Uh, not a hat. And Tuki and Dr. Erica have a little bit of bedside manner uh, conversation, you know, just easing things up and revealing a little bit of uh, Model Land history. Nothing too important, but one thing that I find rather amusing is that Dr. Erica tells her daughter, Kamina Marsh, to think about her name all the time. So I did the thing that I probably wasn't supposed to, and I looked up what that meant. Kamina is Spanish for walk, and Marsh is French for walk. The doctor has a kid with skates for feet who she named Walk Walk. Look, it's Pac-Man. Waka Waka. Bravo also stops by to get some stitches taken out when he sees Tookie and decides to sit down next to her. They talk a little bit. Tookie finally is able to uh, actually chat with him. Zarpesa getting humiliated and ignored because Bravo is very much not interested in her. Bravo reveals that he's actually here for the architecture of the place. And also, he gets to imbibe in some of the treats in the vending machine because... We male mortals can't get this good stuff on our side of the mountain. They load us up on protein only. If it's not a piece of meat, an egg, or some powder, we don't eat it. Protein. And so the two of them start sharing snacks from the vending machine, and like Zarpesa gives a line that I think kind of cements my idea that she no longer exists to be a bully, but a target for banks to take her frustrations out on. Let me help you with that, Bravo suggested. He took the munchie from Tookie and held it to her lips. She opened her mouth to take a bite, and as she was wrapping her lips around the sweetness, a thick pool of her bloody saliva dribbled onto Bravo's hand. Yuck! Zarpeza screeched from her bed. Tutu just mouth pee peed all over you! <laughs> the 
The conversation with Bravo ends when the doctor comes up and says that Tookie needs to be taken to the operating room, which is called the Or You OK. Everything's got to be a pun in this book. Please. Please. We can't take any more stick. They knock her out, but once she wakes up, Tookie has sleepwalked again. And she finds herself in the M building, the administrative center that the Belladonna and the Gurus uh, have their meetings in. While in the M building, Tookie overhears a conversation between the Belladonna and CL. And there's a moment that exemplifies Banks' writing style, or an element of Banks' writing style. And it's not good. Now, when you are reading or writing things, it probably feels really comfortable to have, like if you're listing something, uh, it feels comfortable to have three examples. And there's kind of this weird reason that goes back to folktales about that, but uh, three is enough to set a pattern and give you a solid rounded idea of whatever you're talking about. Plus three is a comfortable number. Three shall be the number thou shalt count and the number of the counting shall be three. Banks, however, in multiple ways will over uh, describe whatever she's talking about. Um, another example of that is earlier when Tookie's father did that tumble and then he had to, uh, he took a bow to his adoring, applauding, whistling, screaming fans. A single adjective would have gotten the picture across, but Banks felt the need to overinflate the moment by throwing out every descriptor that she felt like using at that moment. And this moment here with CL, as she's complaining, does very much the same thing. You made one grave mistake, CL said, and I don't mean torturing me for half a friggin' year, or making me do war of words in my first year uniform, or demanding I answer calls at the Model Land Agency where I've had to tell clients CL is not available to model for you because she's an ingrate, or forcing me to clean the floors of the ugly room with my tongue, or gagging me like a horse, while you pry my eyes open and make me watch old Model Land propaganda films for seven hours at a time while you drip saline in my eyes so that they don't dry out, or denying me food for three days in a row to slim my thick hips, or making me feel so crazy and deranged that I have to freeze my face into a half-pleasant expression to hide the agonizing pain my body is truly suffering from every day. Three examples would have gotten the picture across just fine, especially because we've already seen some of these examples of CL being punished, so you could have included different things that we haven't seen, like uh, answering the phones and saying CL's an ingrate. Instead, Banks draws the moment out so long that it stops being amusing. After a while, it stops being funny and it starts being awkward. Five is right out. The scene continues and Seal confronts the Belladonna, accusing the Belladonna of having messed with the predetermined admissions list. Yes, all of the Bellas that are selected for Model Land are predetermined. T Dodd, the day of discovery, whole thing's fake, it turns out. But what's interesting is that the Belladonna herself interfered with the list and replaced one of the worthy candidates with Tookie. Tookie was never supposed to be at Model Land. Her sister, Miracle, was. We had a short chapter following the uh, pilgrims going up the mountain. Creamy apparently knows a little bit more than she was letting on. See, the group gets attacked by uh, Monsters called flute creepers, basically small worms that uh, crawl like poison people and then try to eat them. Uh, she not only knows how to defeat them, but also that their hearts contain an anti-venom. Hmm, I wonder what this is leading to. What's alarming is that they've been marching for about three months and they've only just now passed the first barrier, or what they're calling the first barrier. What does that mean? I don't know, they don't really define it. They're not quite there yet, that's the problem. The next day, Tookie's out of the hospital and runs into Bravo again, who immediately starts hitting on her. Your lips look perfect, Bravo said, eyeing Dr. Erica's handiwork. No swelling, nothing. They look ripe for your first kiss. But, like every anime with a romantic subplot, the moment gets interrupted when Tookie 
gets cold feet and runs away, so the first kiss is delayed for another day. Later that evening, Tuki and the rest of the Unicas are talking about what Tuki overheard while she was with, uh, while she was in the N building, and about how disastrous and dangerous that whole setup is, about what they, like, maybe they really are going to be sacrificed because, uh, as CL revealed, well, Tookie wasn't supposed to be there. And if that's the case, the rest of the Unicas might not belong there either. So, it makes sense, in a way, that they are getting that they're being set up to be sacrificed. Completely ignore that Model Ant has already spent who knows how much time and money educating them in the ways of being a model, so... That doesn't really make sense, but they're all like 15, so I guess there's some degree of lapse in judgment that they're allowed to take. So the Unicas decide they need to find a way to escape. Now there might be a zip zap that can lead them out and take them straight to somewhere in Metopia, but it's been hidden and they have no idea where to look for it. It could be somewhere in the stadium that they're building, the one that was destroyed by the fireball and that they've been, uh, the guys at uh, Bistosterone have been rebuilding all year, but they'd still need to find it first. How does that work? How does it not manifest itself? I just, I don't ask questions, just shut up and accept it. Especially considering that the Zip Zap surrounded Tookie in the one chapter where they were introduced, so I have no idea how these things work. They're just magic zippers. Oh, now what? I suppose you're gonna show me- Oh, 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 gee, that's very nice. Oh, what is this, some kind of magic act? <laughs> Meanwhile, CL's uh, reputation starts uh, swirling the drain because the the Unicas figure out that her nickname that uh, Nars gave her, Body Girl, actually means Dead Body Girl. But oh no, one of the background characters, Desperata, you know, the one who misses her boyfriend, decides to uh, leave Model Land because she misses her boyfriend too much. Well, she decides to take the obvious route and jumps over the walls and will, like, run down the mountain somehow that way. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but okay. And as soon as she jumps over, she gets hit with a bolt of lightning. Here's where I don't like that. A thick lightning bolt struck the wall, making everyone jump back. It sent an immense fountain of color into the air, and the barrier became transparent. Suddenly, Desperado was visible on the other side, lying still on the ground. Is she dead? Sarpesa chirped a little too excitedly. Desperada's body jolted, and she struggled to stand. Slowly, she rose to her feet, facing away from the crowd, her hair blowing in the howling wind. She brought her hands to her face. Desperada's body was unchanged, but dark brown spots covered her cheeks and forehead. Wrinkled jowls drooped on either side of her jaws, and deep lines ran from both sides of her nose to the sides of her mouth. Her skin was pale and crumpled, like a cotton shirt that had been rolled up into a ball. The outer corners of her eyes had, had branches upon branches of crow's feet leading off to her temples. Her hair had turned gray, thin, and brittle, exposing parts of her scalp. Lightning struck again, and the wall reflected Desperada's image back to her. She let out a blood-curdling scream. I'm sorry, she said, pawing at the wall. Let me back in. He won't want me like this. Then lightning strikes the wall again, and it uh, reverses the transparency. Here's why I don't really like that, though. The punishment as far as you leave the walls and magic lightning hits you and ages you 50 years, okay, fine, that's absurd, but within the magic system of the universe, I can believe it. But Banks put herself in a situation where she had to create so many steps for this to work that it's not really worth the effort. Instead of having students, like, line the walls because Desperata just jumped, like, I don't know, 20 feet down to the ground and they wanted to check to see if she was alright. You could have had lightning hit then and everyone's like, oh my god, Desperata, you look like an old woman! Instead, we had to have lightning strike the wall to turn it transparent, strike Desperata so that she looks old, strike the wall again so that it became a mirror so Desperata could see what she turned into, and then struck the wall again to turn it back to normal. There are too many steps in this to make it work. The old adage, keep it simple stupid, is a long surviving rule for a reason. It applies to writing, absolutely. If you can take an idea and simplify it, go with the simpler solution. More times than not, it's the better option. Otherwise, you've gotta start packing on more rules and more descriptions and 
it runs the risk of bogging down your writing, slowing the pacing down, and potentially uh, creating contradictions for later on in the prose. Now, Desperata leaving like this serves as a chance for the Belladonna to lecture everybody about how she's always right and she knows what's best for everybody. So what could have been a one-off lesson turns into this whole stadium-filled pseudo-funeral for her where the Belladonna breaks into song for some reason. Leaving for a man? Leaving for a man? Leaving for a man? The Belladonna whined. The room trembled. The next time the Belladonna spoke, she sounded like she was poised on the ceiling. Desperation, her voice continued, clouds your minds, robs you of clear thoughts, makes you think that a man is the answer. He is not. In the civilian world, women are more valued for giving birth to babies than for giving birth to their dreams. Not here, not now, not ever. And just because she exists to be kicked around, Zarpesa chirps in. But Madame Belladonna! Even in the darkness, the voice was instantly recognizable. Zarpesa's voice continued. I don't think it's wrong to live for a man. Their intelligence is far greater than ours, and it is our duty to submit and love and... How dare you speak when I am speaking, and such nonsense on top of that! The Belladonna roared. Where on earth did you manage to come up with that rubbish? So you could derail your life to be with a man, you would risk your face, your model and Detoxabella future, for that nonsense you call love? Love, the Belladonna repeated, is an excuse to be stupid. It is one of those weird situations where both sides are wrong, because the Belladonna goes on to say, the, uh, we come to model and to say goodbye to love. Yeah, because nothing's brewing between Tookie and Bravo. There's an entire chapter, like, five pages long, that's dedicated just to Zarpesa going insane. It leads to nothing. It's just another in a list of Zarpesa being used as a punching bag moments. The only thing that really adds anything, I think, is at the very end when uh, people are like, hey, you knew who Zarpesa was beforehand. Why do you think she's acting crazy like this? And she has an opportunity to tell them, oh, well, her whole life is a lie and she eats out of a dumpster. All eyes were still on Tuki, waiting for her answer. Even Zarpesa had gone silent in the fridge, as if she suddenly had her wits about her and sensed what was coming next. Tuki lowered her eyes and shrugged. I know nothing about her, she said in a low voice. Nothing at all. And I do like the character that shows. It's Tuki being a good moral person. She's actually standing by some degree of principle because she decided not to sink to Zarpesa's level, you know, very much like what Ciel warned her about, and she sticks to it. The problem is, we've already gotten that scene. There are like two other examples I could list of Tuki doing exactly that, where she had a chance to reveal Zarpesa's horrible secret, and she doesn't do it. It's good. I like that she has that kind of moral consistency. It's the only moment of note in the chapter, and it's one that we've already gotten before, so it's not really needed. Bravo swings by to visit Tuki again, and they share some awkward flirting. Bravo's lopsided grin snaked its way up the side of his face and right into Tuki's heart. Oh, I hurt my hand during a photo shoot on the roof, and I came here today because I needed to have my thumb sucked. Ugh, keep your fetish away from me! But Bravo also reveals why he likes Tuki. See, the problem that he's always had his entire life is he's way too pretty. Are you kidding me? She blurted out. You want me? Seriously. Brava didn't break his gaze. These other girls here, they chase after me like I can solve all their problems. It's always been that way for me, not just here, and it sucks. I open my mouth to say hi, and women damn near pass out or want to marry me. And I'm not even old enough to get into a club in Loderno. And he reveals that he's always wanted to be an architect, but... People have always admired him for his looks, and they've overlooked his uh, apparent intellect and talent with designing things. What is this? A center for ants! What? He even had a couple of heroes that were supposed to be, uh, arch like, wanted to be architects. They attempted to climb 
the mountain to uh, reach model land so they could study the architecture up there on top of the mountain and they died on the diabolical divide and all that was found was their bloody torn clothes and architectural drafting kit here's a question how were they discovered unless model land actually sent an exposition down to the diabolical divide to retrieve the bodies how could their bodies have been found? Because no one from Metopia would have been able to climb up there and get back. Granted, there is a profession called a raider that's just supposed to be able to climb up and go back. That's what they claim. But the Diabolical Divide has a 100% fatality rate. Like, nobody crosses it. That's kind of a, a defined thing within the book. I don't know. It's a small thing, but it's annoying. And the scene ends as Bravo asks Tookie out, and she agrees. Awkwardly. They fell silent for a moment. Tookie ducked her head. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I can't wait to lose my lip virginity to you. Back to Creamy and the other pilgrims climbing the mountain, they eventually reach some sort of a graveyard, which is marked by a few headstones for Muse Melodia, Muse Princia, Muse Chromia, Muse Dramatica, Muse Fabricia, and Muse... I'm not going to get that, so I'm not going to try. Creamy has more or less taken over the group because, for some reason, she seems to be the only member of the entire uh, campaign that actually knows what she's doing. She has so far countered two separate monster attacks, and everyone has pretty much just given up and stepped aside and let her call the shots. Something of note, though, is that in the last monster attack, uh, a girl named Jessamine was slaughtered, devoured by the monster as well as her mother, which left Miracle as the most stunning girl of the group. But as the group takes a break in the graveyard area, they're approached by another monster. As the group continued to stare, the air filled with the sound of feet flitting toward them, and in the distance, the source of the noise appeared. It was a spider-like creature, three times the size of a Peppertown City bus. But instead of eight legs, this creature had thousands. And the legs looked... human. They stuck out of the creature's body like spikes of a por on a porcupine. When the monster reared up, it revealed a soft, fleshy underbelly. There was an immense leech's sucker in the middle. Tiny but numerous sharp, toenail-shaped uh, teeth rimmed the opening. The monster attacks going after another teenager and her mother. The creature contorted, then reared back and exposed its toenail sucker mouth. A forked tendril extended from the center. Two sharp toenail clipper blades on the end of the fork made scissoring actions, slicing both Harriet and Lynn at the hips. Oh my god! Abigail scre screamed. Do something, Creamy! I'm your leader, not a magician, dear, Creamy said dryly. The leg leech burped out a pile of Harriet's hair and threw the two women's legs onto its body. They instantly attached, still kicking wildly. Then the creature balanced itself on a group of ten legs. It began to waltz in place in front of the surviving pilgrims. Now, obviously something like this would be a horror show to behold, and there's like no way that they could really uh, defeat the monster with the like, tawdry weapons they have. They only have like basic spears and knives. Clearly, something like this, the si like three times the size of a bus, would be way too much for them to take on, right? Well, not for the power of really stupid, contrived moments in a joke of a book! I know how to save us, Creamy, Miracle yelled. Dancing! Creamy looked at her, relieved. Do your thing, Miracle baby. Dance in your spirit and in your body. Miracle gazed up at her mother, touched that for the first time, Creamy supported her dancing. She proudly ran in front of the leg leech and began a rousing back and forth dance routine with Bellaissima in her arms. Slowly and joyfully, the leg leech retreated, backing away like a thousand ballerinas in unison. If anyone had been standing just a bit closer, they would have noticed that swaying along with Miracle and Bellissima was one of the ancient tombstones, the one marked Muse Prancia, to be exact. And then, like, a lot of things happen at once. Two of the other pilgrims, uh, Kamada and Abigail, run into a fireball and die to the point where not even Ash was left. Creamy says the beauty balance is restored, so she's got some really sinister undertones to her character. More fireballs form in the air and they launch at the 
uh, now four remaining pilgrims. It's Creamy Miracle, uh, Bellissima the Dolls being counted for some reason, and another weirdo named Hunchy. Well, the fireballs hit, and it seems like everyone has died. There's a few minutes of silence until one person stands up. Hunchy jumped up from the mud and shook himself off. All that running and dodging had worked up his appetite. He followed the sweet scent, not of blood orange, but of the pancreas and thymus glands that lived within one particular platinum-headed unica, and he resumed his trek to model land. Alone. Now, I haven't been really listing it too much because there's a thousand other things going on in this book and I'm kind of on a schedule here. But Hunchy is described as kind of a creepy hunchback character. He is pursuing Piper specifically, as that passage just detailed, so that he can eat her pancreas. <laughs> He is a Legizard, you know, one of those weird monsters that uh, the people of Sans Color have to have floating buildings in order to avoid. And you might be thinking, oh, so we're like this close to the end of the book. Obviously, he's going to show up in the climax and there's going to be some sort of a weird dramatic showdown. You'd, you'd think that and you'd be wrong. Hunchy doesn't show up for the rest of the book. One of the other core problems that the book suffers from is that the closer the story gets to the end, the more plot points just kind of fall apart sporadically. Banks tried to do way too much in one book. She set up so many different plot points, so many different characters, so many different world building moments, and did not have enough, like did not give herself enough time and didn't plan well enough in order to actually utilize all of them. So. Some of them can be explained by saying, okay, we're saving that for the sequel, that's fine. But then you've got other moments like this with Hunchy that just have to stop because there's not enough time. And trust me, the climax gets really crowded with a whole lot of other stuff. Plot your books out thoroughly before you start writing them. An outline will save you potentially months of headaches. Back in Model Land, uh, the Unicas have decided that they're going to use the confusion of the upcoming Man Attack uh, exhibit in the new arena and uh, escape once all of that is over and done with. See, the emergency zip zap they're looking for is somewhere in that stadium, and because Bravo worked on the stadium, he was able to reveal where it was. Now, he did that off screen, so this kind of feels like Banks forgot to write it in earlier and it doesn't really feel complete, but there you go. And yet, Tookie feels really guilty about using Bravo the way that she did. You see, oh, also, uh, Tookie is uh, one of the competitors for Man Attack. She kind of got signed up without being told about it, so that's a thing. As much as she tried to tamp the feelings down, it was undeniable. She was in love. A love so deep, she never thought it could happen to her. So, yeah, Tuki is completely in love with Bravo, completely forgetting about what's-his-name from the beginning. You know, the guy who gave her that stupid vote-for-love button. Or rather, the one that she fished out of the garbage. Well, it was good to see what that led to. We get to the man attack scene, and... I'm gonna go through this as clearly as I can, but a lot of it is... Well, I mean, this this line from Gunero, I think, uh, sums it up pretty well. Guru Gunero's voice blared through the air. All you pure and prude Bellas, it's time to lose it. Your man attack virginity, I mean. Report to the Orb Arena at once. And don't forget to bring protection. Elbow and knee pads, that is, he snickered lewdly. Oh, that's not the end of it. Strip, the mannequin said. Tookie stared at her. Excuse me? Didn't you know? The mannequin's thin lips curved into a smirk. The man attack is performed in one's underwear. Yeah, these are teenagers. This is uncomfortable. I'm a minor, stop! So, man attack is kind of this random as hell fashion show mixed with the Thunderdome. There are three matches between Model Land and Bestosterone. Tuki will take on Bravo, Zarpesa, and Chase will also compete against two other models from Bestosterone, Alexander and Webb, friends of Bravo. Guru Nars is the uh, announcer for the match and explains how Manatech is supposed to work. Nars continued, 
As it has been played for eons, there are four phases to man attack. First, the touch. Oh yes, contact, people. Between man and woman. Second, wardrobe. But if you want, you can stay half-nude. Fun for the crowd, oh yes indeed, but point deductions for the players. Third, maquillage. Makeup, that is. Foundation for the girls. Mandation for the boys. Can someone get me some? My color is Ivory Sands number three. Oh, and watch out for those pesky explosives, lads and lasses. And fourth and finally, the snaps, the photo finish. Yes, we take pictures here because they last longer. On one hand, like, this is really creepy. On the other hand, I think I kind of see, like, looking at this from the best possible, possible perspective, I went into this book treating it like it was going to be a criticism of the fashion and modeling industry. There are a number of things that I can use to substantiate that claim. This is a pretty strong one. The sexualization of teenagers. Really creepy. And happens in the modeling industry. So, if you look at it from that perspective, Banks is using this book in order to point out some of the darker elements of modeling. Which is great. You know, bringing light to something like that, I think, is very important. Because that stuff ain't cool. There are also a number of ways where you have characters that are openly speaking out against the beauty norms of Model Land. Uh, Zen Zen does that, CL does that constantly. Uh, Tuki and the uh, Unicas are uh, examples fighting against the norms that Model Land pushes. And in that way, I think this book has potential to be good. That's part of the reason why I enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, if that was actually what Banks was attempting to do, I don't know. I can't confirm that. I haven't, like, through all the multiple interviews I've seen, I haven't actually seen her conclude that that was what she was going for. But that's just part of the challenge of trying to find meaning in a book. You've got to be able to actually bring up sources from the material in order to substantiate your claim. You can't just say, I think this book is about how fluffy bunnies are without ever referencing bunnies or their fluffiness. That is a stupid idea comparison thingy. I, it's late. I've been filming for several hours. I am tired. I just want to get through this stupid book. So Chase and Zarpesa have their rounds. Both girls win their competitions. And while that's going on, Tuki reveals that she planned on leaving Model Land without Bravo, and he reveals a secret of his own. I'm sorry, Tookie said, trying to shove all her tumultuous feelings aside. Then Bravo crossed his arms over his chest. Well, Tookie, I'll tell you a little secret too. You and me kissing? It was nothing but a bet with my boys. Her head whipped up. What? That's right. There was no joy in Bravo's smile. I made a bet with Webb and Alex that I could get a funny-looking girl to fall in love with me. The pretty ones? They're easy. But the weird-looking ones, they're the ultimate challenge. Yes, it was all a ploy taken straight out of She's All That. My bet? My bet? Am I a fucking bet? So Tuki and Bravo enter their match against each other, Tuki in a very foul mood, actually backhanding Bravo in the face at one point. And despite that, Bravo tries to help her during the match. Tuki, you have to get dressed, Bravo urged. Put something on, he gestured to the floating clothes around her head. Look, no amount of context I give you is going to make any of this make sense. Let's just accept that. Tuki, for some reason, takes this moment. Instead of applying the makeup that she's supposed to be during the third round in order to win this match, she goes off about what her perfect first kiss would be. It's going to be under a perfect sunset near a garden of golden flowers spreading as far as the eye can see, Tuki said, making it up as she went along. The lucky guy who will get to pucker with my suckers will be wearing a tuxedo and and he's going to sing me a song he wrote and he'll dance to it. It needs to make me laugh and make me cry. Bravo blinked. Are you for real? Hell yeah, I'm for real. Then he will open up his shirt like a superhero, she went on. On his chest will be written, Tookie, you are the most amazing girl I have ever laid my eyes on and I can't decide which I love more, your green or your brown eye. <laughs> You'll have to touch my face gently with both hands. Her eyes spilled newer, fresher tears. And he'll kiss my forehead, both of my cheeks, and then my nose. 
then he'll spray whipped cream straight into my mouth, and then his, and then he'll part his mouth just a little and press his lips against mine. And for me, it'll feel like the kiss will never end because it won't, it'll go on forever, and it'll be amazing. <laughs> Bravo, he claims he doesn't take pity on uh, Tookie, but he intentionally stands there so that she can throw something called a maki ball, a uh, ball of makeup or something. It doesn't matter, it's almost over. The match, not the book. And she throws them at him and they explode and she gains 50 points. Tookie shouts that she deserves better than Bravo and he says, is that why you're leaving? You want to be with him? And then he reveals, I can't believe you girl and just so you know there was never a bet. I just said that because I was pissed at you. Because you used me and I wanted to hurt you back. But now I think there should have been. We are just going all over the place with this emotional roller coaster. It is perfectly absurd. But then weird stuff happens, and then a smize appears, and Tookie grabs it and puts it on her face. And apparently, this is like some sort of a real rarity. Like there, there hasn't been a smize in a man attack competition for decades or something. And Tookie ends up winning 106 points for Model Land, uh, the most out of anyone competing that night, absolutely won, and it's, sir, you know, hooray. Then all of a sudden, the arena goes dark. Well, that was actually Dylan dimming the lights, so it's time for them to escape. All the Unicas gather together, they find the Zip Zap, Tookie takes them straight there, they, go into the zip zap, they take the wrong turn, like there's a fork in it somehow, and they wind up in the Diabolical Divide. Then they get back in the zip zap, and then they wind up in Lodorno, the fancy part of Metopia. Yeah, that, uh, that could have been cut. Well, the Unicas are now free of Model Land and wandering around Lodorno, uh, completely of their own volition. Now it's just a matter of what do they do with their lives? Well, before they can really make a decision, they worry someone might be chasing them. What, like, what if it's CL? It turns out, no, the person chasing them, I know it sounds so fast and so sporadic. That's really the pace of the book. It just, it gets so choppy at the end of the, the book here. The girls talk about what they should do. They talk about going back to their homes, even though Tuki doesn't really have one to go back to. But they see CL's familiar pouch in flying mode, like when she was a scout. So it looks like CL's coming back to collect them. So of course, they've got to scatter. They dive around through various alleyways when all of a sudden they run into Lizzie. I don't blame you if you've completely forgotten who Lizzie was. She hasn't been seen in almost 400 pages. See, this is what I'm talking about. Things get set up in like chapter seven and now they're being utilized in, let me just get this right, this is chapter 38. Lizzie's eyes locked with Tookie's and she let out a joyful yet mournful yelp. The two girls ran for each other, crashing together hard. After a long embrace, Lizzie stuck her hands out to her sides, palms up. Tookie did the same. Both girls pointed to the sky, then made a motion as if checking their underarms for ascent, then did a deep curtsy. What's up, hot queen? They cried together. Most friends have some sort of a unique handshake. These two T-pose and sniff their armpits. But this reunion is interrupted as Ciel shows up. Lizzie takes one look at Ciel, then turns and runs away. The rest of the Unicas do the same, but the Unicas make their way onto a bus, demanding it drive them out of town as fast as possible, when all of a sudden, then, Tookie looked out the front windshield. Ahead of them stood Lizzie, frozen, staring at the oncoming bus. Don't run, Tookie screamed at her through the glass. Lizzie, stay right there. Lizzie blinked, then stared at something on the ground. It glinted in the moonlight. She bent down to pick it up. Tookie stared at the shiny, sharp metal object in Lizzie's hand. Lizzie then raised it and brought it down hard into her inner wrist. No, Tookie yelled. Then the bus speeds by and slams on the brakes and Tookie smashes into the windshield. The Unicas are okay. They climb out of the bus, although they have no idea where Lizzie is. But before they can find her, Ciel confronts them. But instead of rage that the Unicas had escaped Modeland, Ciel was sobbing. You see, 
They found the plaza in Ladorno where the Day of Discovery had taken place, and you had those big three obelisks. You remember those from way the hell back in Chapter 8? Seal actually reveals her backstory and how the obelisks were formed. See, she had sister friends, as she calls them, Hendel, Woodland, and Catherine, which she referred to uh, Shiraz, Piper, and Dylan for some reason. As soon as she made it big as a triple seven in Model Land, she came back to visit her friends and told them that Model Land's rules were ridiculous and they deserved to be there more than she did. See, her friends actually developed the Pilgrim's Plague and they tried climbing uh, Model Land themselves, even though CL could have very easily flown them up there, or teleportaled, or whatever the hell you want to call it. And yet they chose to climb and they died in the Diabolical Divide. CL went up to the, the path, dug their bodies up, and brought them back down to Ladorno, where she buried them in the plaza and constructed the obelisks on top of them. What's weird is that the Belladonna didn't like them and wanted them to be removed, but most people in Ladorno thought the obelisks were some kind of mythical sign, and in the six months after I put them there, tourism increased tenfold, so the mayor allowed them to stay. The Belladonna demanded they be taken down, but she has no jurisdiction over Metopia. Now, I'm confused by a number of things because this is where logic starts to really fall apart. Even as, as weird as that sounds, the logic the book is depending on in order to have any kind of structure, it, it's starting to fail here. Seal says that she was planning on charting her friend's bodies through Ladorno in order to show the world that it was time that people understood that Model Land's narrow beauty ideals are flawed and in need of change. But Guru Nars got wind of the plan and she was forced to change that, so she created the obelisks as monuments instead. But the obelisks were, like, their meaning was lost in translation and had quite the opposite effect, and instead of being a testament to Model Land's cruelty, was seen as some sort of a somewhat deified effect of Model Land's superiority and talent. Also, the Belladonna is in charge of the Day of Discovery, which is a holiday which would dwarf Christmas, or whatever the equivalent of it in this world would be. And yet, she can't get the mayor of one town to get rid of some obelisks. Like, I really don't understand how the power dynamics of Model Land are really supposed to be, because it sounds like they are loaded with influence and ability, and yet they can't order, or at least negotiate, the removal of some obelisks. Also, in the classic moment of, if you idiots had stopped and talked for 20 seconds, none of this would have happened, Ciel reveals that she was never planning on sacrificing any of the Unicas. No, she actually broke the rules in order to bring them to Model Land in the first place. Ciel blinked hard. Killing? Are you serious? Do you realize how I rebelled to get you three to Model Land? The rules I broke? On the day of discovery, you weren't on the list they gave me. I got rid of that thing and specifically chose you three instead. You see, Tookie, her name was put there by the Belladonna. It was originally switched from whatever the uh, list was first. But, since Ciel saw that the list was changed, she decided to make her own amendment. Ciel even says that she brought Dylan, Piper, and Shiraz specifically because they reminded her so much of her friends, or sister friends. And with that finally resolved, CL takes them back to Model Land. Oh, did you think we're done? We're not. We still got like 90, almost 100 pages left to go in the book. Also, the narrator's back, and we haven't seen her since, like, chapter three. The narrator just repeats a lot of stuff that we already know about, about how CL was not a murderous sociopath. She does have a line that I rather enjoyed. But enough about powerful bitches, darling. And the narrator gives us a new pejorative for the 7-7 nickname. The stuck-up, straggly, strep-throated strumpets with stenchy, stupid styes. Why is it that bitter bitches have the worst halitosis? Ciel gets the Unicas back to Model Land in time to run into Zen Zen, who's about to compete for herself to become an Intoxabella officially. But through all the excitement and alarm sounds suddenly, as a creature is seen crawling over the walls of Model Land, the scaly charred monster turned and stared directly at Tuki. Its sooty eyes narrowed, and hundreds of cracks of dry mud covered its face. Tuki's gaze fell to the monster's hands. 
There was a filthy, tattered doll tucked under its arms. A doll Tookie knew all too well. This wasn't a gizzard. It was... K creamy Tookie cried and promptly passed out. Well, Creamy and Miracle close behind her uh, breached Model Land, and Creamy immediately starts demanding the Belladonna respond to her. I know, this is a lot. We're almost done. This is so boring and forever taking. Eventually, Persimmon, the mannequin who responds directly to the Belladonna, uh, brings Creamy, Miracle, and the Unicas to see the Belladonna. Not a statue, but the Belladonna in the flesh. And this is where the climax of the book starts for real. This is where a lot of plot threads get wrapped up, uh, including some that you didn't even realize were happening, because the setup was actually really sloppy. But one thing that we learned early on was that uh, the reason why the Belladonna had Tookie selected for uh, the Day of Discovery. With another tug, Tookie went stumbling back to the Belladonna. You're right. My heart has never healed and never will, she said cryptically. But revenge is so sweet. My bringing Tookie here instead of Miracle made you catch the Pilgrim Plague. And that tastes so good to me. But yuck, you survived the journey. You see, Miracle really was the one who was supposed to be selected. But... This was an attempt to screw with and possibly kill Creamy. Her survival was kind of an unforeseen possibility. She is perhaps the first person to ever scale the mountain, at least after Model Land was formed. Creamy and the Belladonna go back and forth butting heads until Creamy dis uh, demands that the Belladonna make Miracle an official member of Model Land, or else she'll tell. Creamy and the Belladonna start pulling on Tookie as if she's a rope in a tug of war, when Tookie breaks free and bolts for the flashback room, where the Belladonna gives this line, Nars, I need you, come now, there's an intruder in my oo Hey, phrasing! The door seal in the flashback female's room, sealing Tookie, CL, the Belladonna, and Creamy all inside. And that's where we get a multitude of flashbacks, starring three women named LaDonna, Lada, and Percy. LaDonna is the Belladonna, Percy is Persimmon, and Lada is Creamy. So, I'm just going to truncate a lot of this because a lot of stuff gets revealed here. And while I normally enjoy having a bunch of plot threads wrap, uh, wrap up all at once, this is kind of heavy-handed and it shifts the focus of the story away from Tookie. And I think that's a mistake. But... There is a reason for it, and I can confirm it, but we'll get to that in a moment. So, the backstory of the Belladonna and Creamy. They were all in Toxabellas together at one point in Model Land. However, the Belladonna had a civilian for a boyfriend, which, for some reason, wasn't allowed. Like, you're not allowed to hang with the normies, I guess. And they're all exceptionally talented as models. Uh, Percy even has a chance of being a rare triple seven. One day, the Belladonna got kind of sick, wasn't really feeling well. So Percy and uh, Creamy, they go to the bathroom to see if the Belladonna's all right, and the girl on the other side of the stall just groaned again. Then the knees rose from the ground and the girl slumped onto the toilet. Tookie could practically feel her pain. She'd had a similar reaction to her chocolate binge, which was why she couldn't have even the tiny, teeniest taste of the stuff anymore. After a moment, there was a large splash in the porcelain. Suddenly, a small, piercing cry rang out. But it wasn't the sickened cry of a young woman wrecked from tainted food. It was the cry of a tiny baby emerging into the world. CL's eyes widened. You are kidding me. You see, in this way, I kind of like that... Uh, model and erases periods because now it's so much harder to tell if you're actually pregnant, which the Belladonna was. <music> However, teenage Belladonna getting pregnant like this at such a young age was definitely a hindrance to her mother's plans. So the mother stepped in, uh, the 
then Belladonna, or Queen Belladonna as the book differentiates. Percy takes her Centura belt and wraps the baby up and holds onto her for a moment when the Queen Belladonna barges in and demands the kid. Tears ran silently down LaDonna's cheeks. What are you going to do with my baby? I will give the child to its father, LaDonna's mother held the baby at arm's length. He will raise it. As for you, she turned to Percy, how dare you try to hide this from me? And you wrapped the baby in your sacred centura? Persimmon, your time at Model Land is now officially over. I am sending you back to where you came from right now. And just like that, Persimmon, her possibility of becoming a triple seven was over, and her only way of staying in Model Land was to become a mannequin, which is what ended up happening. Apparently, Persimmon didn't really have a choice because her home uh, was home to the cult of persecution. But then we get another flashback as the Belladonna dropped the baby off with the father. And we've seen the father at this point uh, flirting with uh, LaDonna. Like, apparently, he was doing some acrobatics and helping move things around in... Uh, in Model Land, doing some building, and was quite light on his feet. Who does that sound like? Suddenly, Tookie had a terrifying epiphany. The acrobatics, the grace, how he'd spun LaDonna around at the fashion show so effortlessly. Was it possible, really possible, that this was Chris Krim Crobat, her father? Well, the father lovingly takes up the baby and cradles it inside, uh, taking care of it. But that's when uh, she noticed that the baby was actually cradling a shoe. And she knew that shoe. The Belladonna's boyfriend, the father of her child, wasn't Chris Krim Crobat. He was Wingtip. I don't blame you if you've forgotten who Wingtip was. He was the homeless guy who showed up for like two pages in chapter five. <laughs> it's another thing that took forever to pay off. I am so tired of this. But we get another flashback as LaDonna and Creamy decide to jump the fence at Model Ant to go visit Wingtip and check in on the baby. Now, there is the aging barrier to consider, and Creamy does bring that up, but LaDonna insists that she's royalty. I can get it reversed and will return in plenty of time for you to primp and put on that gorgeous brand new 7-7 tournament jerk dress of yours, I promise. Well, they jump the fence. They both age 50 years in an instant, and then they go to meet uh, Wingtip. Also, his name is, like, his real name is uh, Ray Fay. Well, LaDonna meets her, uh, meets her baby, and they have a moment, and all of a sudden, LaDonna had to step out to go, like, get some, uh, some milk for the baby. Uh, some formula. Instead of Creamy volunteering to do that so the couple can stick around together, but whatever. Well, Creamy, it turns out, is kind of horrible. I know, I am sure you're shocked. Ray's footsteps rang out in the hall. He entered the room holding the baby. As soon as he saw a Cremolata on the counter, he stopped short and placed the baby in a small cushioned basket. Cremolata shot across the room, grabbed him by the collar, and threw him onto the kitchen table. She climbed on top of him and started to moan. I saw you looking at my body at that fashion show. You know you want this. A real girl, not some stiff royal one. Get off me, you nasty-ass sick girl, Ray screamed. But that's when uh, LaDonna enters back into the room, sees the situation, assumes that uh, Ray was cheating on her, and she and Creamy go back to Model Land without Ray or the baby. But before LaDonna and Creamy can escape, Model and Security breaks into the house uh, along with the Queen Belladonna. Now, LaDonna is holding her baby, and I know this is a lot. I'm sorry, guys. It's almost done. This is insane. LaDonna is given a choice. She can stay with the baby and uh, abandon her youth, or she can go back to Model Land, eventually become the Belladonna herself, but she has to give up the baby. She chooses to give up the baby. Oh, you bitch! Stop questioning everything! Oh, that goddamn bitch! Oh, 
that goddamn bitch. Oh my god, she's gonna ruin it all. Creamy, on the other hand, was abandoned. She was no longer allowed in Model Land, and all the wrinkles she had that seemed to defy explanation because they make her look way, way older than she actually was, well, that's where they came from. LaDonna made a pained noise at the back of her throat and rushed for the baby, but her mother thrust out her arm to stop her. You have made your choice, my dear. You will go on to be a famous Intoxabella, and one day you will rule this land and be feared and adored by everyone in the world, except for the mayor of one section of a country who won't take down a couple of obelisks because you said so. And what about my baby? LaDonna screamed, pointing at her pale child. What will happen? Your baby will be safe, her mother said vaguely, but gone forever. You will never lay eyes on the child again. Please, LaDonna cried as Percy took the baby away. Let me hold my baby one last time, just one more kiss. Oh, LaDonna, stop being so dramatic, the Queen Belladonna scolded. LaDonna sank to her knees as Percy vanished down the long hallway with the child in her arms. Give her back to me! Give me... My CL! Yeah, did you think that this whole thing was about Tookie at all? Nope! This entire backstory sidetracked the protagonist entirely, and it was all about CL. CL has now become the focal point of the narrative. Where's Tookie in all of this? Pretty much irrelevant as of like four chapters ago. And I think it's safe for me to confirm at this point that although Tookie is something of a self insert for Banks, as an awkward teenager, CL is a self-insert for Banks as a successful model. Yes, this is a self-insert story with two self-inserts of the same person. I cannot think of any other example where I've seen that and it was meant to be played straight. And what people don't know, and I'm saying it now, Google Plus exclusive, CL is me now. She is me now. Wow. When you read CL, and you, I know Sharon Tina, you didn't even know that girl. See, you know what the fam did. Yeah, read CL's parts again now. And how she talks, she's like, I'm funky. And, -do -do. and she's just like so perky and crazy. She's me. Wow. So with the final flashback revealed, the door opens and everyone's able to escape. So we have this uh, meeting of old friends, Persimmon, Creamy, and the Belladonna. All tensions have risen to this point and we get something of a very brief fight scene the belladonna uh uses her powers to change her clothes she's got this big spiky thing going on creamy doesn't care she is an emotional wreck right now and just charges right for her creamy lunged for the belladonna once more just as their bodies clashed a piercing scream rang through the air bellissima flew across the room droplets of something landed on tookie's cheek then dead silence. Creamy and the Belladonna huddled together for a moment as though locked in an intimate embrace, but then Tookie saw a sharp, shiny metal object piercing her mother's gut and protruding clear through her back. The two women were skewered together with a spike from the Belladonna's dress. Boy, talk about a fashion disaster! Shut the fuck up, you're not funny. And then Tookie has this tender moment as she lets slip uh, calling Creamy mom, and then just falls next to her, like, just trying to comfort her, because, you know, her, her mother is, like, severely wounded. What was that, Creamy? Tookie asked, gently bringing her ear closer to her mother's lips. All the negativity she'd felt about her mother was instantly replaced by a fervent, protective love. Creamy might not have been the best mom in the world, but she was all Tookie had. If these were Creamy's last moments, Tookie wanted to be there for her. She wanted Creamy to know she loved her. Creamy swallowed as if mustering up her strength to utter her last words. Then, through cracked lips, she spoke, Tookie, get me my bellissima. That is, that is just tragic. Model and security runs in and uh, they see the scene with Creamy bleeding on the ground. Persimmon suggests that uh, the Belladonna intentionally injured Creamy. We know that's not actually true, but apparently she's holding a grudge. And Tookie does nothing to correct the record, so the Belladonna is actually hauled off, because she might be the uh, queen of Model Land, but she still's not allowed to get away with murder. Well, Guru Nars actually uh, announces that the 7-7 tournament that they, that 
all of Model Land was looking forward to was actually postponed indefinitely, which is a huge deal for, uh, for Model Land. And for the citizens around Metopia, because hospitals from Terra Bossa Nova to Tulip were flooded with victims who'd fainted from the hideous blow. Fashion designers fell into debilitating depressions, shocked that they would be given no new muses for inspiration. Some abandoned their showrooms. Others hurled themselves off of their tall buildings in Ladorno, their bodies crashing to the street in front of tourists and children. Guru Gunero's announcement had cut off the world's oxygen supply and they were desperately gulping for air. Well, Creamy survived. She just fell into a coma because she lost a lot of blood but she was put into the ugly room where she will be punished if she ever wakes up. The Belladonna was also put into the ugly room where she's strapped down to a chair and is forced to look into one of those mirrors that make you look really ugly. Clearly, this is the cruelest of all punishments. Stop it! Stop it! Please! I beg you! Despite this, Ciel is actually able to get a few minutes with the Belladonna now that she knows the Belladonna is actually her mother. And I had a question if, like, because the, the reveal of the Belladonna's baby being Ciel raised a lot of questions, like, why did Ciel keep the name Ciel? What was the Belladonna's reaction when Ciel suddenly appeared as a Bella in her youth? I mean, did she ever try to investigate Ciel for such a ridiculous and coincidental name? A lot of questions to ask. Guru Nars was planning on killing Ciel for what she did when she dug up her friend's bodies and built the obelisks, which, I mean, really doesn't seem like that big a deal because it doesn't really threaten Modeland because no one took it as such, but who cares? The book's almost done. But the Belladonna couldn't let that happen, not to her child. And the Belladonna reveals that the secret of Ciel's name is that Every time the Belladonna saw her, even now, she saw love. That's why I named you C.L. Sea love <laughs> What kind of stupid name is that? C.L. is brought to the six members of the board, and there's this whole thing about how C.L. is about to be executed, but instead of actually cutting her head off, uh, the blade just, like, just lets out a little bit of blood, and then they put a uh, crown on her head and say, to the new Belladonna. That's a great start to the new regime. Just pointless trauma. Let's just not uh, ignore that. She was actually dragged through the streets by her hair and she's effectively royalty uh, at this point. So y'all are getting executed. Now twists like this about, oh, CL's the new Belladonna. That can totally work, but the build up to it has to make sense. And then, CL makes uh, Guru Nars kiss Tookie's feet. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit! As a whole bunch of things get wrapped up, um, Tookie and Zarpesa have kind of a moment, and then that gets pushed aside as Bravo actually enacts the entirety of Tookie's perfect first kiss, where he has his guys actually like right out on their chests. Tookie, I'm so sorry, it was never a bet. I'm gonna try to read the song that he sings, cause he, in accordance with Tookie's demands for a first kiss, you know, part of it was a song. <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to do this straight faced. Oh, Tookie, 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 I love you more than architecture and Lauro's oatmeal cookies. Went to the feds cause my heart was failing. The purse said no bravo, De La Creme's got your pulse sailing. Oh, Tookie, I never wagered your lip nookie. In your eyes is the only place I want to looky. You've taught me about loving and giving. I was a rookie. You're so pure and sweet, and now I'm hooky on Tookie. Would have been more romantic if you developed a meth addiction. And then Tookie and Bravo share their really weirdly described kiss and have a nice romantic moment under the uh, sunset. And they continue to kiss. Tookie opened her palm and let the defective purloined Tookie button fall to the grass. She didn't need it anymore. And then we get an epilogue where Tookie and CL uh, meet and start chatting with uh, with each other about how, oh my god, it's so crazy that everything built up to this. Tookie 
writes a new entry in her team mail jail about you know how she was actually strong this whole time and all that like she was the leader of the unicas and she devised the plan to get them out and she and cl start flying like cl's guiding her along and all of a sudden cl starts she gets the sensation she's about to tell portal and like that's fine because sometimes she can't control it so the book concludes with the intoxabella and soon-to-be segunda bella shot like arrows toward the earth a black hole opened up as their bodies approached just as Tookie and CL entered, the hole magically seamlessly swallowed them up, and the two of them disappeared. And that is the end of the book, at long last. I know that was crazy, I'm sorry that it probably got a little out of hand there, especially near the end, but that's just the way the book is. I tried to condense as much as I could. It took me three tries to film this review. This book is that crazy. So one of the central themes that Banks was attempting to play with was the idea that beauty norms are bullshit, which is a perfectly laudable goal to be playing with. It's a good message to put into your story. The problem is it feels really hollow. It feels like you've got a few characters saying, yeah, beauty norms are bullshit. Anyway, so like I was saying, it's a side note, if anything, because you don't really have anything substantive backing it up. Yeah, you've got Tuki and her friends who fall outside of the beauty norms, going around through model and doing everything, but they don't get that kind of definition or attention to really seal in the message. Especially near the end when all of the attention was taken away from Tookie and given to CL, who does fit all the beauty norms. So the messaging itself kind of like falls flat at the like especially at the end of the story, because all of the supporting arguments you've got going for it are just a few people saying, yes, I agree with that line of thinking. And that's not really enough. You can't just have people saying, I agree with A, and then do nothing to back up A. It's even worse when you actually start to research Tyra Banks because even though she, she often does tout the idea that beauty can be found in all shapes and sizes and ages and races, it's a great message. But I've seen, and this again goes credit to um, Cruel World Happy Mind, there are plenty of times in America's Next Top Model, where she actually goes against her own argument, saying you don't fit certain beauty norms, and then models are, they, they lose points, effectively, for minor things like having a gap in one's teeth. So Danielle, you went to the dentist, but you refused to have your gap closed. Do you really think you can have a CoverGirl contract with a gap in your mouth? Yeah, why not? This is all people see. It's Easy Reads Beautiful Cover Girl. It's not marketable. Yeah, just a little bit is okay, but I don't want to completely close it. Well, I guess she just left the gap wide open for another girl, baby. I agree. The message is hollow because the person giving it feels hollow. And like I said, I tried to go into this with a positive attitude. I actually, to an extent, gave a, like, tried to work to find a particular message that I would have agreed with. The modeling industry and fashion in general is bullshit. Okay, I mean, that's that fits my own beliefs. And I found examples that could substantiate that within the text, but I'm not sure how much of that was actually intentional on the author's part. It feels like something she would say, but not something she would mean. And unfortunately, I did have to skip a number of notes here so let's just go through what i can real quick there's like a, a theme there's two themes for me that are really strong in model land one is bullying bullying is another theme in model land one which also falls flat as we saw with zarpesa becoming a punching bag halfway through the story but tyra claims that she was a bully ran the girls click in school and was also bullied for her look uh, for her looks as a kid by her brother and by prominent modeling agencies when she got uh, by a prominent model when she got into modeling. Tyra wants everyone to celebrate her uniqueness, which is another big theme in the book, but again, there's nothing done to really substantiate it. 
how does Dylan being larger than others actually accentuate her character? How does it, how is she able to beautify that ideal? How is uh, Shiraz being short or Piper being, uh, having albinism actually make their characters stand out within the context of beauty standards, that is. Effectively, they're all different faces in the crowd. Now, we're a little more familiar with them because they follow Tuki around so closely, but the world itself doesn't really react to them at all. There's no real rejection of them because they fall outside their beauty norms. You don't have teachers really relentlessly bullying them and saying, get the hell out of here, you're not good enough to be in my class. You don't really see bullying from other students uh, for any number of reasons, except for Zarpesa, but she sucks to everybody. I did try to keep my opinion of the book separate from the author. Ah, damn, I forgot. I was gonna have like a whole list of seven jokes just because of the seven seven. I didn't set any of that up. Just as well, if I used a seven reference every time the seven seven got mentioned, I'd run out of clips and have to start reusing them. I almost want to say there's a certain heart behind this writing style. It isn't good, but it strikes me like Banks wanted to make a fun adventure story and didn't exactly know how to do it well. But the intention was there. To the book's credit, Tuki did not end up being revealed as the most gorgeous girl ever just because she took off her glasses and undid a ponytail. So at least it did stick with the whole, no, she's got two colored eyes, they're too far apart, her forehead's really big. At least there's some dedication there. I do like the intended message about empowering people and saying that they can be anything, but it feels inauthentic if that message is punctuated by them getting a hand up from somewhere. Why not show me an entrepreneur who climbed up from nothing? The set pieces and presentation in this book lead me to one question. Why? It's the same question I present to the fashion industry. Most of it is hideous stuff that you wouldn't ever see in the streets or in real life. The entire industry makes very little sense to me. I can understand it from the way the Devil Wears Prada explain it with trends trickling downwards, but in real life, you have models walking around with trash bags and you <laughs> realize that Zoolander wasn't much of a parody. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. The pacing in this book is very fast, not to the point where I can't keep track of things, but point after point are introduced with little time to absorb them, and I'm not sure how much of this will be important for later. I can tell Banks used a lot of imagination and time to construct all of this, but it feels like a good portion will go under uh, unutilized. There is a wide range of weird shit that I watch. Like, I watch Bosch videos, and some of this is getting a little too much even for me. Anyone else? I got crap! Please, tell King Neptune of me! One thing that I noticed is that as I was going through, a situation would arise and it would raise multiple questions on my end. And I was both impressed and dismayed by the book's ability to answer my questions about the world building within minutes of me asking them. It's like Banks knew that certain situations were going to be troublesome, so she set them up in such a way that she could answer them almost immediately after their introduction. Oh, there's something about blood oranges that get mentioned a lot. Like, occasionally Tuki will smell blood oranges, and I couldn't really see any real connective theme between any of those moments. But it happens enough times that I started taking notes on it. Never leads to anything. If Modeland is meant to highlight a narrow idea of beauty, then why would they allow Tuki and the Unicas to stay in when they don't fit that definition? Real doctors follow the Hippocratic Oath. Modeland doctors follow faces before hands. The book has a lot of great ideas, but many of them don't have enough room to breathe on their own. It's like having a garden. Normally, what you'd want is a nice row of flowers, each spaced out just right so they have enough room to spread out, but not so far apart that they look lonely. What Banks did is she compressed everything together so that she has a ton of flowers, but they're all constricting each other. We have no idea how long it actually took the Pilgrims group to climb Model Land Mountain. This book is a maniacal, ego-driven puff piece that often overshadows the protagonist for CL or the world building. Multiple ideas are brought up and clumsily dropped leaving hanging threads that could be answered in a follow-up book, but that would look more like a messy cleanup than a plot thread. 
I read this book as a critique of the fashion and modeling industry, and while it does have a few notable insights and comments to make, the message ultimately falls flat with CL dispassionately decrying beauty standards are bullshit with the same enthusiasm as filing for a life insurance policy. The book does have good moments, plenty of them, but so much of the story falls apart by the end that I'm left with mixed feelings. If you go in wanting a fun time, you might get it. If you want insanity, you'll definitely get it. If you want a strong story, look elsewhere. This strikes me as a story where the author needed some confident beta readers but was surrounded by yes men instead. Five out of 10, not the worst, but not what it could have been. This book isn't good, it isn't bad, it's harmless. And there are a multitude of questions that are left unanswered. Why did Creamy emotionally abuse Tookie? What caused Creamy to stop loving Tookie? What happened to Miracle? Is she getting kicked out or executed for breaking into Model Ant? What happened to Theo Lovelace? Was Crobat really not Tookie's father? Would Wingtip ever get a happy ending? What happened to the creeper climbing the mountain with Creamy, the hunchy? Were the Smizes ever sent to specific girls that could explain why Tookie was picked? What happened to Lizzie? Is she even alive? Because keep in mind, as soon as they ran into CL after they were in Ladorno, the whole idea of what happened to Lizzie was instantly dropped. Some friend you are, Tookie. What were the other buildings in Model Land label as? Why create a magic system with the Centauras if you're not going to do anything with them? Ugh. And that is it. That is Model Land. This book is... Oh, it's something. And I'm sorry, I know it took longer than normal to get this review out, but life has been hell for the last couple of months. Leia needed surgery, Ash needed surgery, my job was up in the air for a little while because there was a contracting dispute and we weren't sure if I was actually gonna have steady employment for a while. Oh, that was a fun month. And I've gotta clear out my entire day if I'm gonna film one of these reviews, so unfortunately I wasn't able to actually sit down and do that. But, I was able to read my next book. I'm already done with that, so hopefully the next review won't take me too long. Fans for a while have been telling me to actually try to read something good for the sake of my mental health, and considering the insanity I just went through, I decided to take them up on that offer. And to that effect, my next book review will be a novella written by another YouTuber. Now hopefully this next video won't take me too long to film and edit, we'll have to see. Now there's almost an endless supply of terrible books written by YouTubers that I could go after, but I decided to try something different, and I delved into another booktuber specifically. This particular booktuber happens to be the biggest aficionado of the Wheel of Time this side of the Two Rivers. The Disheveled Goblin, the host of Fantasy News. My next review is going to be Breach of Peace by Daniel Green. As you can see, I've already got my tabs in place, so with luck, this won't take me more than a month to produce. How well can a proper booktuber write? Join me next month and find out. Because today, I am wise enough to know that my beauty is not defined by you! Beauty is all shapes and sizes, all colors and genders, young and old, tall and short, thin and thick! Real beauty lives in the land of and! Yeah, I said it!